Okay. So, um, my name is Jeremy Levy. I'm the director of the Pittsburgh Quantum Institute, and I uh, just want to very uh, briefly welcome all of you to PQI 2019. Um, and uh, I also want to uh, uh, briefly introduce uh, Rob Rutenbar, who is a senior vice chancellor uh, for research. He's sort of the, you know, the architect uh, of um, sort of research at the University of Pittsburgh. But actually, Rob, um, we were he was we were he was doing the calculations. He's actually from Detroit, uh, but he spent almost half of his life in Pittsburgh. Uh, he was at Carnegie Mellon University for uh, 25 years before um, being the chair of the computer science department at UIUC, and then he was recruited back here to Pittsburgh by our chancellor. Um, and um, so I will give the microphone to Rob to say some introductory remarks. Okay, hey, uh, thank you, Jeremy, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be at PQI 2019. Very happy to be here. Very happy to um, um, also just be back in, uh, back in Pittsburgh. Um, so um, as Jeremy said, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the senior vice chancellor for research. Um, think of that as basically the VP for research. So my, my responsibility is basically the, the health and care and feeding of the broader research platform at the University of Pittsburgh. So that ranges from compliance activity to contracts activity to um, trying to help people do new and interesting things. I don't know if anybody has, you know, who works in the quantum field deals with sort of IRBs and human subjects. I don't know if people can be, you know, emotionally damaged because their wave functions collapse, but if that's actually possible, it would be people in my outside of the universe that you would actually have to figure out how the protocols work, how the protocols work for. Um, I am. Uh, um, I have. A, I have an interesting cheat sheet that's been provided with uh, with with interesting data. The first the first PQI event um, was held back in 2013, so you've already apparently passed the half decade point. So that's awesome. Um, very proud of that. Uh, um, for, for, uh, for Jeremy and the team. PQI now has more than 90 faculty members and 300 student members from Pitt, from Carnegie Mellon, and from Duquesne, from physics, from chemistry, from engineering, and engineering ranging from material science and engineering to electrical and computer engineering to computer science to chemical engineering, and also um, uh, folks in, in uh, philosophy and philosophy of science from the, from the humanities side of the world. So it's, a, it's, it's an impressive, broad, um, array of the uh um, the humanities and the and the sciences, we are we are clearly at um, a crossroads. I will I will share just an interesting event in my life from from two weeks ago. I was in London at a particular conference at which a, a particularly notable New York Times Times columnist who shall not be named came and gave a particularly interesting uh, keynote speech. A particularly foundational pillar of which was his unbounded enthusiasm for Moore's law and its continued evolution. Um, it is clearly you know responsible for the vast majority of our wealth and emotional happiness, and he's just incredibly happy that it's going to continue. Um, I did not feel it was appropriate to stand up and offer a counter opinion. Um, nevertheless, um, I was deeply, uh, deeply uncomfortable. Um, I am, I am personally a chip guy. Um, I have several, you know, good friends who wear bunny suits and uh, and do things. Um, uh, you know, I have um, I have hung out on the edges of uh, the semiconductor space for um, for most of my life, and I am uh, you know extraordinarily aware of the fact that um, uh, you know in Morse Law land, as we you know as where we were you know we're delivering things at the seven nanometer node. You know, we'll see whether or not there's a five. You know, maybe there's some crazies who think there's a three. I'm pretty sure there's not a one um, for uh, for appropriate for appropriate technologies. Um, if there is something after the the illustrious 50-year run of uh, of CMOS and and before that bipolar technologies, um, it's probably not going to be a conventional transistor. And there's a, a lot of uh, you know tremendous amount of aspirational hope that the quantum universe actually offers something for for uh, for the computing universe. And one of the things that's I think the most interesting about the you know the quantum landscape is that just like the 
traditional um, you know, computational landscape, it spans a vast hierarchy of levels of abstraction and, and, and interesting things. There's, there's fundamental physics that we don't actually have completely worked out. We don't exactly have um, a winning device like, like the bipolar transistor was for 20 years, and then after that, the, the, you know, the complementary metal oxide semiconductor transistor was for the next quarter of a century. I don't know if it's ultra-cold atoms. I don't know if it's photons. I don't know if it's topological semiconductors. You know, I'm assuming that we could have interesting emotional arguments involving alcohol for any of those particular particular topics. I'm assuming that some of those things are going to be discussed here. Um, I'm I am I am uh, here to 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 assure you that I'm an enthusiastic cheerleader for whatever works. Right um, at the end of the day, hoping that at some point somebody builds a lot of qubits and entangles them appropriately, and we can build computers out of them, and we can build systems out of them, and we can figure out what algorithms do on top of them, and we can use that stuff to go after things in quantum information and quantum complexity space, because it's not like we actually have answers up and down that stack. It strikes me that um, uh, you know, there's at least another half a century of sort of interesting job security, right, in that uh, in that landscape. Assuming you guys can sort of figure out how this stuff actually works. So um, I'm extraordinarily positive um, about uh, about work in this landscape. In the United States, anyway, there is a vast and rising interest. Um, what is it, something like $1.2 billion authorized across the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and NIST. I was um, recently at a National Science Foundation meeting. Um, I co-chair the advisory committee for the size directorate, the computing side directorate of the National Science Foundation, which is about one-seventh of its budget. It's about a billion dollar um, budget. And at that meeting, the vice president of research for Microsoft, Peter Leaves, another Pittsburgher, um, a buddy, a co former Carnegie Mellon colleague, said, you know, one of the things, like a sort of a calibrational thing to note is that it's probably the case right now, if you look at the significant players on the industrial side, just in the United States, if you look at the Microsofts, the Google, um, and the IBMs, the total investment in quantum probably exceeds the total investment in computers by the National Science Foundation. And that is sort of a transformative thing to think about. And we're not even scratching the surface of what this, of what this opportunity zone probably, probably looks like. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm in the National Science Foundation for trying to figure out how we can up the investment here and how we can bring more players to the table. So we're just at the sort of the early phases here. Um, I'm very happy that at Pitt, um, several years before I got here, um, Jeremy and, and uh, others in the, in the sort of the quantum leadership here, um, put the center together, tried to start nucleating some critical mass, started aiming things um, at bigger and better and more systematic and more unified approaches to the, you know, to the, to the work. There's been investment in young faculty. There's been investment in, in infrastructure. I think it's, it's well, you know, well obvious that that stuff is, um, is paying off. I am trying to be as helpful as we possibly can at my level at the university to be supportive of uh, future, future efforts here. I am thoroughly um, convinced that probably any single person in this room with 72 hours notice and a sufficient supply of caffeine could write an outstanding quantum proposal. Um, however, um, and probably some of you have done that, um, but you know, when you actually start trying to go after the 10 million, the 20 million, the 50 million, the five investigator, the 10 investigator, the 20 investigator, the two school, the five school, the 10 school kinds of things, it turns out you need the entire institutional platform to sort of behind you, and that there's just sort of a broader land landscape of sort of connections and components and stuff. And one of the things that I'm happy to do is, is try to make the institution's um, resources available to provide some oomph um, in that direction. So I look forward to helping to provide some more oomph for the quantum stuff in the, in the future. Um, happy to welcome you all to three days of sort of everything quantum celebration. And I hope you have a great time here. Whoops. Uh, my name is David Waldeck, and I'm in the chemistry department here at Pitt. Uh, we have three s s speakers this morning. Uh, the first speaker will be Natalia Berloff. She's in uh, applied math mathematics at Cambridge, uh, and she's very interested. Uh, but this is 
about such a structure to uh, the one challenge dealing with our bottom part, the body, one bit that those goes on. That's, he's going to tell us. Thank you, um, and many thanks to organizers for giving me this opportunity to present you a newcomer to the field of quantum simulators, analog simulators, uh, in this case, polariton graph, graph simulators. So yes, my home institution is Cambridge, but I spent three um, volatile and exciting years in Moscow, uh, starting the center of photonics and quantum materials. So the experimental results that I'm going to present actually came from the hybrid photonics lab there. Um, I will start with acknowledgement. So the theoretical part of what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, was done in collaboration with my PhD student Kirill Kalinin. But it's really the glory goes to the experimentalists who were able to realize this sometimes absolutely um, unsustainable or crazy ideas that theorists may have. So the work started with Jeremy Baumbeck and Nana Photonic Center in Cambridge in Cavendish, where for the first time we looked at the lattices creating polariton condensates in some simple geometries, creating them in the corners of equilateral triangles or squares, etc., and seeing how the coherence between these condensates is established. But the idea of using this platform for simulation, for solving hard optimization problems, um, took off with Pavlos Lagudakis first at Southampton lab, and then he moved um, actually part time to Skoltech to help to bring this activity to life. Uh, the idea that many people are playing in this field is that we would like to create a physical platform, a simulator, that somehow finds the global minimum of a complex optimization problem, but of a classical problem. So for instance, you can think of the NP-hard problem, classical computer can only deal efficiently with the small size of the problem, so we're trying to create a physical platform that, of course, will also take an exponential number of steps to solve this problem, but will take it faster than von Neumann architecture. So this is the main idea. It's not about algorithmic to find in a polynomial solution for NP-hard problem. It's an attempt to do it faster than classical computer, still in exponential time, but if you do it faster, it means that you can solve problems of the higher dimension of the larger number of variables. And initially, this uh, uh, this uh, idea has been exploited within the context of equilibrium systems, and some of them are mentioned on this famous diagram, um, because the equilibrium system have well-defined Hamiltonian. So if you map your optimization problem into the Hamiltonian of the system, the system will be in in the minimum of this Hamiltonian. But the problem is that the system, the equilibrium system, they typically end up at the local minimum rather than global minimum of this Hamiltonian. So instead, the focus has shifted to non-equilibrium systems. Non-equilibrium systems have control parameter, the gain, the forcing, the injection of the particles to bring the system to threshold. And as you rise this, uh, this control, the pumping, the gain, uh, from below, the idea that something dramatic happens, for instance, the phase transition will happen at the global minimum of a Hamiltonian. And so in my talk, I will also, I will talk about the polariton simulator, but I will also discuss the requirements for any such non-equilibrium platform to become a global optimizer. So the outline of my talk, I start by introducing polaritons and polariton condensates um, and how to create the simulator from them. I will formulate the mathematical platform that describes the operation of the simulator using the coherent centers. The centers that have well-defined amplitude and phase, and they coupled uh, in such a way that the system minimizes uh, the underlying spin Hamiltonian. Uh, 
So I will formulate the requirement for such system to find the global minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. I will extend it to also cover Ising and the clock or uh, n planar Potts model. And also I will touch upon polariton graphs to be a paradigm for the systems of coupled oscillators. And then we'll see what the new physics will come from the system. Uh, so the recent interest in these gain dissipative platforms, of course you all know about a uh, coherent Ising machine, Yoshi Yamamoto, using the optical parametric oscillators and time multiplexing. Uh, Near Davidson from Weizmann used lasers in the cavities also for the purpose of minimizing the XY Hamiltonian. So we introduced our polariton graphs um, platform. And polaritons, half light, half matter particles, after that have been also uh, used in experiments on the trapped condensates in Jeremy Baumberg group and Hamid Ohadi group in St. Andrews. Polariton micropillars, where polaritons are created at the top of this uh, structure lithographically structured micropillars were also elucidated as a good candidate for topological insulators. And finally, photon condensates have been, um, there are attempts to use them also as the as, as, as such platform for minimizing the XY Hamiltonian. What is the common between all these systems is the element, the bit of this computer, of the simulator, is the phase the classical phase of the order parameter of the classical complex number associated with the state of the system that also has an amplitude. But these, these are the phases that are mapped into the spins of the corresponding Hamiltonian. Okay, so what is the polariton? In our experiments, polaritons are created in semiconductor microcavities. Quantum wells are created by alternated gallium, uh, aluminum, indium, arsenic atoms of about 10, um, thickness of the 10 atoms um, in the quantum well, surrounded by Bragg mirrors, by reflectors. In this case, these structures are made in such a way that the light of a particular color, of particular frequency, can be trapped in this semiconductor microcavity. So as the laser is shined into the structure surrounded by the de Bragg uh, reflectors, the exciton gets, uh, the, gets created. Electron is excited, leaving a hole behind. And this electron hole pair, exciton, um, is an excited state of matter. So the exciton tends to spit out the photon. If the mirrors are in resonance with the, with the exciton, the photon gets reflected, becomes, excites exactly the same exciton, gets re-emitted, reabsorbed, and that creates a superposition of states called exciton polariton or polariton. So polariton is half light, half matter. It comes from hybridization of exciton and photon, and therefore from the uh, dispersion relation of the photon in microcavity and the exciton comes the so-called lower polariton branch of and upper polariton branch. These are uh, light particles, so we can vary the proportion of the photonic and excitonic components, but the typical mass is 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 of the mass of the electron, billion times lower than the mass of the atoms in ultra-cold BECs, for instance. These are strongly non-interacting non systems, and the main source of the interaction is through the electron exchange between the excitons. But the mirrors, the Bragg reflectors, are not perfect. So after bouncing back and forth, photon gets through these mirrors. Therefore, there is a short lifetime, the particular lifetime of the particles. In our experiments that I'm going to talk about, they of the order of the 10 picoseconds. In spite of the such short lifetime, there are many bouncing back and forth um, effects before, so we can talk about the thermalization of the system. But therefore, it's a non-equilibrium system, and this is good and bad. This is also a blessing because the exciton, uh, because the photons, as they leak through the mirrors, they carry all the information about the state of the matter in the cavity. So in our experiments, the laser will be at the high energy, creating the source of the, the free carriers, free particles that scatter, relax, emit phonons, and then condensed at the bottom of the lower polariton branch. 
and the photons being the continuation of the wave function of the condensate give us the information about the energy and momentum distribution, density distribution of the condensate in the semiconductor microcavity. The experiments that I will refer to are based on inorganic microcavities made of gallium arsenide and indium and aluminium atoms. However, also in hybrid photonics lab in Skoltek, we realized uh, the room temperature condensation using the polymers. It's called yellow body pi because it's an invisible part of the spectrum. It's actually yellow. Uh, an important thing to realize, so now uh, to create the condensate, so we have this two-dimensional plate or plane of where the excitons live, and we can use a spatial light modulator to create the condensates at a particular point, at a particular position on a two-dimensional plane. This is a two-stage process. So as we pump, so this is just a single pump, let's say with a Gaussian profile, first the hot exciton reservoir is created, a large hill of these hot particles that then scatter to create the condensate, but it's a non-equilibrium system. Because of the losses, to have a steady state, the laser should be continuously on, and that gives the non-equilibrium dynamics, so it gives the fluxes even at the steady state in the system. So the polaritonic particles spread from the point where they are crea created, and there is a characteristic velocity of their propagation, this outflow wave vector Kc, which, as you can see, quite important for, uh, for the coupling strands between the condensates. This outflow wave vector, wave number, is controlled by the pump geometry and the pumping intensity. Okay, so this is the system that we have in mind, and the story start, started um, uh, using the polariton lattices with a fully theoretical proposal we put with Jonathan Keeling from St. Andrews, where we propose to create the condensates at the corners of equilateral triangle. And actually, we were interested in what happens in between. So clearly, if there is a coherence in the system established, then the density profile between the condensates is just the superposition between the wave functions coming from the three condensates. And then we propose to use a magnetic field to change this, these structures. This is the vortex lattice of positive and negatively charged vortices. So that's what we thought is quite interesting. Um, it's this, this paper stayed in archive because the referee said, you know, it's just a theoretical proposal. The, it's not possible to implement experimentally. Uh, so we went, uh, we went to Jeremy Baumberg at that instance, and within two weeks of our conversation, he actually produced exactly what we predicted in our paper, and then it went into nature physics, etc., etc. So the only difference was that we proposed to pump in the thickness of about 10 microns, and he said it's easier for him to do one micron um, uh, con the size of the condensate, but uh, the, the same vortex lattice has emerged. And then we looked also at two condensates pumping well above the threshold, and then we saw in the energy and the distance space, we saw so there are two pumps about two microns away from each other. The size of each pump uh, is about one micron, but the hot reservoir created the saddle in between, and what we observed is that there, there are the states of the quantum harmonic oscillator. So, seen here on this picture on the, the size of 20 microns. So then we talked about seeing quantum mechanics with the naked eye. So 20 microns, so my hair being admittedly thin is about 80 microns. So it's already visible kind of part, part of the spectrum. So it could be, could be observed by usual optical, optical uh, microscopes. But immediately after this results, the question was, but how do condensate decide on what is the re relative phase between them? So in these experiments, we only observed in-phase configuration. So we understood that initially, as we start pumping at these three corners, the phase is random. And then the condensates grow, or the, the system grows until it becomes the condensate and until the full coherence is established. But what is this mechanism by which the condensates talk to each other and decide which phase difference to establish? So to analyze that, this is actually now the experiment, experiments that we done with Pavlos Lagudakis group in Southampton and then in Skoltek. So we explain this phenomenon 
by stimulated relaxation of the system. It's a bosonic stimulation. So the polaritons are created at the phase configuration that corresponds to the highest occupation. It's simply for the given pumping intensity, we ask the question, if we at the threshold, if we pump at the threshold, only the configuration that allows for the condensation to take place, so the configuration for the maximum number of particles will be realized. So in other words, if we have these two condensates, and now you see the cross-section of them, to maximize the number of particles, if they're equally pumped, there are two possibilities, either they're in phase or with pi phase difference. In this case, you have the maximum interference, uh, the, uh, the maximum of the standing wave between the two condensates. Here you have minimum. And the total number of particles is simply twice the density, the number of particles in these isolated condensates, if only one of them was pumped, plus the standing wave that can give you either pi or phase difference. So you can have the maximum number of particles corresponding to either that or that configuration. Or to extend in this argument mathematically, so the system is trying to maximize the total number of particles, so the square of the wave function of the condensate, that can be represented in the tight binding approximation as the sum of the wave functions of the individual localized condensates with taking into account individual phases with an extra factor. So if I now square this, expand this, I'll have n condensates, each of them have the same number of particles, it's an isolated condensate, and then we have the cosine of the di phase difference between each condensate times the coupling strength, which is simply the integral of this cross product of the function and the, its con complex conjugate. So if we maximize in the number of particles, we, this is fixed, so we are minimizing, therefore, minus of this expression, which is the classical XY Hamiltonian. Okay, so and this has been shown then in these experiments, when we fix the pumping intensity, so we fix the outflow velocity with which polaritons spread from the position where they are created, and now change the distance, so this is about three and a half microns, uh, and then we start increasing, and you can see by the minimum, so this is the density profile of two condensates, we have minimum here, so they're in pi phase difference configuration, then it's a maximum, so they're in phase configuration, configuration, we shift them even further apart, and now we have again pi phase difference. So therefore the coupling strength can be estimated and uh, obtained from our, from, from, uh, from this expression by taking some ansatz, some form of the condensate cloud. Uh, delta here is, sigma here is the uh, inverse characteristic width of the pump, Kc is the outflow wave number d is the distance between two condensates um, and, and, and that's the combination in terms of the Bessel functions telling us that we can by changing either the pumping parameters, the pumping intensity that influences Kc or the width of the pump or the distance between two elements, we can change and we ha can have this interaction strength being positive, negative and also changing the amplitude of the coupling strength. This is not the only tool we can use to change the interactions. Another one is polarization degree of freedom, because polaritons, being half light, half matter, inherit the light polarization. So we can talk about left and right circularly polarized polaritons. And here, for instance, when we have two polaritons, two condensates that have the same uh, polarization, they are anti-ferromagnetically coupled, as witnessed by this minimum between them in this density profile configuration. Uh, if we change the left spot from right circularly polarized to left circularly polarized, all of a sudden the interaction changed and we have in-phase configuration between, between the condensates. Okay, so what is the recipe for building polariton simulator? Now we have all necessary ingredients. So you tell me what is your favorite optimization problem. We map it into spin Hamiltonian. Mathematically, we know that it always can be done. 
and then arrange the uh, map the matrix elements of the spin Hamiltonian into coupling strands of our Hamiltonian, arrange polaritons in a graph, let polaritons condense, read out the phases, and we can do it very accurately by doing an interference measurement, um, expanding one condensate and superimposing on all the other. And then we uh, realize this, this idea in experiments, so what is shown here, so we, we, we've done, we followed the trend of other systems, say ultra-cold BCs and other systems, when they simply show first how the spins can be realized for a simple unit lattice, triangular, square, hexagonal, cadomi, etc. Here I just show some examples, so these are experimental profiles and the density of the, of the uh, ground state configuration. So this is the element of the triangular matrix, but I made it a uh, triangular lattice, but I made it more interesting by slightly um, shifting this, this element towards the center, so that the symmetry is broken, this can be seen because the interference image has maybe one diagonal here and the two layers of um, fringes in here. But then we read out the phase, phase distribution that, and they minimize the XY, XY Hamiltonian. And this is what we have also from uh, mathematical modeling of these systems. Uh, similarly, for uh, this directional coupling, we have antiferromagnetic coupling in this direction, and then ferromagnetic coupling in this direction. And again, from this image, you can see that the phases of the condensate, this classical phases, arrange themselves uh, according to the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. What is the beauty of this platform? That it's extremely easy to scale it up because it's really just a hologram on acting uh, together with the spatial light, mod it's a spatial light modulator by which we can create these polaritons in any geometry we want and with any intensities we want. So we show the scalability, for instance, on these images of realizing 45 condensates and then changing the lattice parameter, the distance between the, the condensates. And the, um, the Fourier spectrum is shown here, uh, showing that this system is in, uh, all elements are um, antiferromagnetically coupled, negative coupling, we change the distance slightly, then they now ferromagnetically coupled, we change it again again, antiferromagnetically coupled, and from the how crisp the, um, uh, the, bre uh, the bre uh, peaks are, we can see that indeed the entire system is in, in a coherent state. Okay, um, this is not the only thing that we can do. To, uh, to have the continuous wave excitation. We can also study the dynamical um, condensation. In this case, you see the lattice of 100 condensates that first arrange themselves ferromagnetically, then reconfigure and become antiferromagnetically and ferromagnetically coupled again as the pumping intensity decreases. So these are pulsed excitation. You created this axiton reservoir or these 100 exciton reservoirs for 100 condensates, they start scattering into the condensates, but as we do not replenish the hot reservoir, the pumping intensity becomes lower and lower and lower, so what you, therefore the system goes between ferro and antiferromagnetic states because of different, different pumping intensities. Okay, so the main principle, so I would like to again, to. Uh, to give this big picture. So what we're trying to do is the whole process is that we start with your favorite optimization problem. Travel salesman, graph coloring, partitioning, max cut, whatever, uh, phase retrieval. We map it into the spin Hamiltonian, either XY Hamiltonian, if the spins, these this phases are continuously mapped between 0 and 2 pi. It could be, I think, it, if we restrict the phases to be uh, 0 and pi, it could be clock or pot model if um, the states are more than, more than 2. And we know that this is, can be done, and in this paper, for instance, Andrew Lucas showed the explicit mapping on all these famous 21 car problems into the spin Hamiltonian, Ising Hamiltonian in this case. And then we would like to create the network of so-called coherent centers. It could be polariton condensate, it could be laser, it could be OPO. And then, so, but, but elements that can be represented by a single complex number that has an amplitude and a phase. And then we populate them from below until something happens, in our case, condensation happens or laser coherence happened, and then read out the 
uh, phase differences, and this is the answer that we map back into the answer of our optimization problem. OK, but let me now formulate the mathematics of this process, because why we can use this idea and represent perhaps the general scheme for many non-equilibrium systems to attain the same thing, the global minimum of the spin Hamiltonian. So what are the requirements for this to work? So I can write down the dynamics, the evolution of these complex numbers, putting the important ingredients. So first of all, I have to have the gain. So this is my control parameter that I take from below. They have to be losses because it's a non-equilibrium system, and the losses should be linear and non-linear in order to have gain saturation, in order to reach the steady state. Then I may or may not have some self-interactions in my polariton system I have, in lasers perhaps I, perhaps I don't. And then I have the coupling term that couples the i's with j's with the strength j i j, and plus I have noise inherent to any, that present in any system. If I simply had a single condensate and I brought the gain to some threshold value, there is a supercritical hope bifurcation when at first I have zero, I have no occupation of this, of this mode, and then there is, there is something dramatic happens again, and this mode becomes occupied. But let me, uh, let me look at the um, fixed points of the system. So if I plug this in, separate real and imaginary parts, then the fixed point, if it exists, gives me the densities of, of each coherent center in this form. And I will write down, the, I will keep the dynamical evolution of the, of the phase untouched. As you, can hear, and as you can see here, this is Kuramoto network known in, uh, in uh, synchronization phenomena, for instance. And it looks like the gradient descent to the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian, except for one annoying feature, that it has this term, which depends on the densities that I do not a priori know until I actually found the fixed point. That's not good. I don't want to solve the problem for which I don't know actually the coefficients before I actually solved it. This is, this is rather useless, I have to admit. So, but what can I do with that? What I need to do is to actually bring all the occupation to a threshold value, to the number that I postulated from, from initially. In my polariton condensates, what we do is during this evolution, as we ramp up the pumping power from time to time, we decrease the pumping power for those modes that have lower densities and decrease for those that have high densities and increase for those that have lower density, again, by reconfiguring the spatial light modulator for that. But this is the key ingredient, and it has to be done. It's essential for all the gain dissipative system. This has to be done for opios, for lasers, for every system that has this description. And if we do that, then if we now go back to the fixed point, and now I will write down the total mass, so I have n lattice side, n coherent centers, that previously I have each has occupation pi i, so now with this control, when I drive all of my amplitude to the threshold value, these become that now I have the total mass that I know before I started this evolution, but now I have to change, so now I have to adjust the pumping rate individually for each of the nodes, but now because I, I brought all of my density to the same value, now these terms don't contribute, and as you can see in my Kuramoto oscillator, now I'm guaranteed that I have coherent state because this is frequency is the same for all my oscillators. So now I have a system that guaranteed to find the, lo the minimum, at least the local minimum, because this is the gradient descent to the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. And at the same time, I arranged it in such a way that I know this before, beforehand, I know this beforehand, but I'm always choosing the total pumping injection rate to be minimum. If this is always at the minimum, then this term is always at the maximum, and therefore I'm reaching the global minimum 
of the XY Hamiltonian, not the local one, because the way I select my injections always from, from below. Okay, but if this is true, then I should be able to formulate this quantum-inspired algorithm. So if I do it mathematically on my classical computer, I should be able to find the global minimum as well. And we actually, we've checked that, and here I give you just one picture illustrating how we evolve these two equations for 100 modes, all coupled with all the rest with uh, random with random couplings and we, we test it on other more sparse matrices as well and we compared it with uh, Bayesian Hopian algorithm a modification of the simulated um, simulated annealing and not only the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian agrees to like 10 significant digits but as you can see the result the minimizers themselves are in agreement so indeed, by involving this, by evolving this dynamical system, the system finds finds its global the global minimum. Okay, but so far, I haven't actually discussed the actual mathematics, the modeling beyond the polariton condensates. I only use some general description of maximizing the number of particles or the principle of its operation being the game dissipative system. So the model that uh, proved to be very efficient for describing the systems, uh, describing this process in this two-stage stage system, is that we have the equations, the Ginsburg-Landau equation on the wave function of the condensate, coupled to the rate equation on the density of the hot exciton reservoir. So I will start with the hot reser uh, with the reservoir given by density this nr. So there are losses, linear losses in the reservoir, and losses because the particles relax and feed the condensate with the scattering rate represented by this parameter. And we have a CW experiment or pump excitation. So we have we pump, we replenish the reservoir with the pumping rate given p. For the condensate itself, we have the usual equation up to this term, which is gross pitayevsky We have kinetic energy. We have the term that is responsible for energy relaxation. This term also present when we trying to um, describe ultra-cold BCs and their interaction with thermal particles. So this is the redistribution of the energy dissipation due to energy uh, redistribution and relaxation with hot exciton reservoirs. Um, we have polariton polariton interactions. We also have the repulsive interactions with the reservoir that acts as the kind of external potential to the particles, increasing their kinetic energy as they propagate from the place where they were created. Plus, for the Ginsburg Landau part, we have the gain, which is the scattering from the reservoir, and we have linear, we have linear losses. So this model uh, describes describe a huge variety of various experiments and is quite uh, quite successful in that. So then we use the, uh, the tight binding approximation. We eliminate the spatial degrees of freedom, assuming that the condensate, the pump, and the reservoir is simply the sum, the linear superposition, in this case of the wave functions of the single, uh, single condensate. Here we have the pump, which is the sum of the Gaussian pumps, and the reservoir is also um, also can be uh, separated in terms of the time-dependent part and the um, spatial, spatial part. And then we integrate the spatial degrees of freedom, and it turns out that, um, and by the way, I have to note is that we have a huge flexibility in controlling all these parameters. Because we can make, by using the different detuning, we can make our polariton more photon-like or more exciton-like. We can change the effective mass. We can change this, uh, th this interaction strength, again, by doing that, and also by having trapped condensate. Create them in one position and then um, and then create so that they flow and actually become the condensate away from the from the hot exciton. We can change. We can tune the polariton polariton interactions. Uh, we can change the 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 losses again by either using lithography to create even change the losses even. Uh, 
in different parts of the spectrum. We can introduce the protons also to change um, uh, these parameters in the system, etc., etc. So all of these parameters can take very different values. For instance, in terms of the losses of the condensate, in our experiments, as I mentioned, is 5 to 10 picosecond by simply growing the number, the layers of Bragg reflectors, we can increase the lifetime to two orders of magnitude, make them 200 picoseconds, etc. So, depending therefore on different parameters, I can use, I can get the different regimes also studied in the theory of various coupled oscillators and lasers, etc., and the synchronization. For instance, if I only neglect the nonlinear self interactions, my system will uh, take the form of Len Kobayashi system. If I use the fast reservoir relaxation limit, so I will assume that the lifetime of the condensate is much larger than the lifetime of the reservoir particles at a particular level, then uh, I can also do density adjustments uh, or without density adjustments, and then again I have different, different. Um, system, different system of oscillators. So if I, under the fast reservation, uh, reservoir relaxation limit and density adjustments, I have, again, the Kuramoto, Kuramoto model. When I have an XY model and the self, uh, and the, um, and the Kuramoto system in this case will always give me the global minimum. That's what we discussed before. Or I can keep my reservoir and the interaction with the reservoir and then I have so so-called uh, Sakaguchi Kuramoto model or if I don't do the density adjustment this is the Stuart Landau model etc okay just one slide on what it gives me because now within a single system I can have a hybrid lattices when some parts of the system belong to one class and other parts of the system belong to a different, different class, even if I pump all my condensate with the same pumping intensity, because the links on the border, um, the condensate on the border have the particle exchange with a fewer number of neighbors, it's like I combine the Kuramoto oscillators with the Stuart Landau oscillators. And in this case, I can have for this lattice, for instance, the large scale oscillations where the mass travels through the system in a macroscopic manner on the order of uh, up to 10 gigahertz. Uh, one thing to mention about polaritons that they are very fast particles, they travel at 1% of speed of light, one micron per picosecond. Uh, and we can have other, other regimes also studied in, uh, in, uh, in, in various oscillators. So, but for analog spin Hamiltonian optimizer, indeed I have to meet quite a few constraints on the, uh, on the, so I need to devise my lattice, to devise my parameters in my system so that various, um, various um, conditions are met. I discussed some of them. So we have to have a particular type of coupling. We should not have kind of the Josephson coupling, so this interaction potential between polariton and exciton should be very small. The um, coupling should be self-adjoint, and that's what we have in our system because this is the real term and the part that depends on the pumping intensities. We have to complement our system to do density adjustments from time to time, and with this we know that the system reaches the global minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. But there is one more caveat that I have to mention, because you notice here that my couplings actually depend on the pumping strength that I, again, don't a priori know. Right? Because I choose those in order to bring all the occupation, all the um, densities of my condensates to the same value. But I can separate them always from the geometric and pump parameters, pump, geometrical pump parameters. And therefore, I also, from time to time, I need to adjust the coupling through the same mechanism. I have to change this term in such a way with this new injection rate, it approaches to the coefficients that define the problem that I'm solving. And this little uh, diagram also gives the representation how it's been done. So this is experimental image that I showed before. Even from the density distribution, you can see that there is no density adjustment yet because they have different densities 
uh, at the boundary of this condensate. So first, if we adjust, and the phases, therefore, are not what we expect. They all, this is kind of spin gloss. So if we adjust the pumping, so now we start, for instance, this is, sorry, it's not clearly visible. It's about 50% to be pumped more in the corners than we pump in the center. And in this case, we have a better configuration, almost anti-ferromagnetically aligned, although there are still not the perfect spins here. And now we change K, and now we move these two layers, and this is even further, uh, uh, like 12% away, and now we have equal densities, and of uh, perfect, uh, perfectly pi phase difference between, between the condensates. Um, one slide on how to do icing. In our experiments, we do that because we can combine non-resonant pump with pumping resonantly. And if we pump at resonance 1, this is just an external field. If we pump with resonance 2, in our XY Hamiltonian, we introduce the penalty for the spins to be deviating from zero and pi. That implements Ising. If we can, um, so this is already within experimental reach. Pumping at high N is hard, but if we will manage to pump, we haven't done it yet, if we manage to pump at resonance three, we can implement the three state ports model. And that's uh, what the um, theory tells us that, that then gives us, the course, the correct configuration for the spins. Uh, and let me spend the last two minutes. Um, the holy gray or grail of what we're trying to do is to be able to create this lattice of the condensates, but then being able to change without playing with geometry. Because of course, if I just play with geometry, I don't have much flexibility. With the three condensates, you can establish any strength to have the fourth couple to all three of those with arbitrary strengths, it's not possible in 2D geometry. So instead, we would like to have a fixed 2D geometry, like square grid, and then being able to change the coupling between any two condensates without affecting the rest. rest. This hasn't been achieved in other system um, accurately, at least to the as far as I know. But in this case, we propose the scheme of how to use the dissipation. So the lighter color correspond to the larger dissipation. Uh, so these blocks are needed to prevent the condensates on the diagonal from talking. And then there are these channels where we can change the dissipation dynamically by introducing biexitons. So this is a combination of lithography and the dynamical introduction of biexitons where we need to make this change. And the spins align correspondingly. And just to the last picture, so for instance, this is 25 by 25 lattice, where we establish the links in such a way that at the ground state, we recover these two letters, staying for Skoltek, but any uh, ex other excited state, actually, you can't see, uh, you can't see um, that these letters were even, even encoded there. But so this image was created dynamically. So again, ramping up from, from the zero. Okay, I think I should stop. So what I uh, try to tell you is that now we have this, for us, very exciting system. I think it has many advantages uh, in comparison with other quantum or classical analog simulators for finding the global state of uh, a given spin, spin model. And then I took you through the steps that we have achieved already or what we still, what we are working on now uh, to really be able to solve these this hard problems. And as a side note, differential equations that we derived while looking at this principle of gain dissipative system also led to some perhaps hopeful uh, classical classical algorithms kind of quantum inspired classical algorithm okay thank you and i'm open to questions Your entire simulation. Your, your entire simulation is, of course, of classical uh, equations. No, it was no, no. It, uh, I showed the actual experiment. So this was simulation part. The rest was uh, the actual experiments. No, but my uh, but my point is, your equations are referring to classical quantities, not yes. as as you said. Are but your ultimate system of 
polaritons is quantum mechanical. Do any of the sort of quantum mechanical underlying effects have anything to do with your experiment, or are they so far away that you don't have to worry about them? Yes, this is an excellent question, and this is to the core of actually the process by which the system finds its global minimum. Because of course, when the condensate is created, it's semi-classical, it's a classical system. But during the condensate uh, formation, this is where we have the quantum quantum mechanics at its play. So we hope, because the key mechanism for achieving the global minimum is for the system to span possible phase configurations before the condensation takes place. And being a quantum, we hope that's, that's where the entanglement, the uh, superposition will help the system to actually span more various phase configurations before the condensate is achieved. We have any other questions? Sure. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Can you give a uh, little more uh, global perspective on the optimization question? Um, to be precise, in order for this to be a uh, to be competitive with other optimizations, uh, essentially, how big do I have to make it? How many condensates do I have to get? And what do I have to do in the way of keeping them quantum mechanically coherent and so on? Mm -hmm. Yes. Again, this is very profound and very, um, you know, it's very, di very difficult to answer short. You know, this, this question is at the core of any, any system, right? So let me just tell you what, uh, what we know, right? So first of all, we know that any hard problem any MP heart problem can be mapped into 2D Ising with magnetic fields where only on a square grid when only next neighbor interactions happening. You know, you don't have to couple everything with everything. Just neighbors interaction. However, the price you pay, you have to be able to establish the coupling to the infinite precision. That for actual, for real system, you wouldn't be able to do. So you need to reach some balance. So you don't have just next neighbor interaction. You can perhaps go to next neighbor, ne uh, nearest neighbor, not just nearest neighbor interaction, but next neighbor interactions, and therefore remove some of the precision that you required uh, between, between the nodes. So there is no mathematical fact that tells us, for instance, if you have two six significant digits, then it's still NP hard problem. We simply we simply don't have it. So hopefully, you know, this is this is one thing that I wish we would have. You know, how many? What is the precision of the coupling that still for the next neighbor interactions gives me the NP hard problem? We simply don't know. On another hand, um, so this is so we either try to have more than just next neighbor connections or ideally couple everything with everything, or we try to make the precision with which we couple the, the, the next neighbor. So this is, this is one, but we don't know to which extent we need to go, to go in this. Um, on, the, on the other hand, when I'm talking about polariton condensate, the process of condensation takes place in a matter of picoseconds. And it does it in this kind, uh, in this, so this is where we try to beat the, the, uh, the, the classical computer. Another thing, these problems that I'm talking about, the spin Hamiltonians, they are in APX class, which means that even approximating it is an NP hard problem, even finding an approximate solution. On another hand, so another, this like third uh, side of the same, of the same question is, even though with this process, even though perhaps we are not find in a, uh, uh, finding the true global minimum or, or global minimum with the perfect precision, we still explore the low energy part of the spectrum. And for some questions, this is good enough. Let it be not the full, uh, full global minimum, but still it's good enough because it's a low, um, a low energy part. Still advantage over simulated annealing when we always go from above. Um, hopefully advantage over adiabatic computing when you have to adjust your system extremely slow um, before you're, you're actually solving your problem. So it, there is no perf 
perfect answer, we still have to go um, and answer many questions before we can say that you know we beat the classical computer von Neumann architecture. Let's uh, thank Natalia for a very exciting talk. <laughs> Our next speaker, uh, for many of us, requires no introduction. Uh, uh, Andrew Daly was one of the original vi visionaries behind the creation of P PQI, uh, and he uh, has remained involved in PQI uh, si since its beginning. Uh, he's at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland, so we've moved a little bit north. Um, and he's going to be telling us about a different sort of platform for doing quantum simulations. Uh, quantum gases, I had thought, but okay. <laughs> okay, um, well thank you very much for the very kind introduction, Dave, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be back visiting Pittsburgh, and a great pleasure um, to still be very much a part of the PQI, um, the, the Scottish branch of the PQI, if you like, um, and you know, so as I say, wonderful to be back here and to see uh, lots of old friends and ongoing collaborators. Um, so um, the picture here, obviously, I'm getting a little bit of feedback from the microphone there, so I'll see if it's better over here. Picture is, of course, of um, Scotland. This is a typical day, of course, in Scotland, and you've got, um, you've got Loch Lomond and Ben Lomond in the background. Um, and what I want to talk about um, is, in particular, what we can do um, with AMO systems, looking at systems with long-range interactions, which I guess, um, again, given that we're in Scotland and sort of a part of the PQI, long-range interactions is, in that sense, also rather at. Um, so the background is that in uh, this area there's been a lot of work over the course of the last few decades looking at many body physics um, by taking highly controllable systems, especially um, cold atoms but also trapped ions or um, polar molecules for example, and uh, controlling them in particular with, um, with light and magnetic fields in such a way as to realize models that initially you might have associated more with strongly interacting electrons in solid state physics. So sort of the paradigmatic example here is if you take cold neutral atoms and you put them in standing waves of laser light, you can make um, Hubbard models um, where you understand that this is really the, the microscopic model under well-controlled approximations. Um, we have sort of systems where you have large length scales and slow time scales, which allows you to look at these systems, track dynamics in real time, also to really go and image things on the scale sort of of a single ladder site or, or single atoms. Um, and so it gives you a whole lot of measurement opportunities and opportunities to control the system that um, you might not have in sort of uh, analogous systems in um, solid state physics. It just gives you a very different sort of parameter regime uh, to go and study this type of physics. Um, and this is nice because it allows you to study both sort of the thermodynamics of these systems and also out of equilibrium dynamics. Um, but what I want to focus on today is the fact that if you take sort of slight variants of these things, especially sort of chains of trapped ions where you can have sort of spins enco encoded on the internal states of the ions and then uh, induce interactions uh, via the sort of collective motional modes of the ions, or if you take things, for example, like polar molecules or rib big atoms that have natural dipole-dipole or long-range van der Waals interactions, that you can actually start to look at, for example, spin models with long-range interactions that arise naturally in these sorts of systems and start to ask what sort of new physics you get in those, um, in those types of systems. And this is kind of a theme of the research in our group. Um, insofar as we've been looking a lot in the, um, the past years at how you can take sort of elements like long range interactions or indeed the ability to create sort of different geometries and optical lattices and think about topological effects and things like that. Sort of ask sort of, you know, what type of new features we see, especially in out of equilibrium dynamics with these systems. Um, we're also sort of very interested in engineering dissipative dynamics in these systems. Um, and some of that sort of is sort of looking at new elements associated with quantum transport. I just wanted to briefly advertise uh, that we have Francois and Elliot here from our group who are going to have posters later today actually on some of our um, recent work thinking about quantum transport by sort of engineering dissipation, um, also associated with cold atom systems, um, but we hope in a way that we'll also be connected uh, to things that you can engineer now with superconducting leads coupled to quantum dots and various solid state systems. 
Um, and we're very interested in the applications of these things towards sort of engineering many body states and indeed doing quantum simulation maybe of models that are connected to these sorts of optimization problems that, um, that Natalia was talking about a few moments ago um, or sort of broader applications sort of beyond sort of standard many body physics of quantum computers and quantum simulators. But what I want to focus on uh, today are these sort of new opportunities, again, really with long range interactions in these AMO systems. So um, there are, as I say, a variety of ways that you can implement these things. And what we've been particularly interested in is the out of equilibrium dynamics that come from these types of systems. And um, so if we think, for example, of starting in a model and then making a sudden change to the Hamiltonian, which we can do time dependently because the time scales here are relatively long, typically sort of millisecond time scales um, for interactions in these, in these sorts of systems we have, we can think about, for example, how information spreads and this is something that people have thought about in condensed matter physics for quite some time and if you have a system that has um, short range interactions then what normally happens is that information spreads or entanglement builds up or correlations build up gradually sort of as each sort of neighbor sort of couples to the um, to the uh, spin or to the position in a lattice system next to it and what you can prove rigorously is that if you have these sorts of short range interactions you get these so-called Lee Robinson bounds uh, coming out of this work in the early 70s uh, where you have essentially a linear light cone for the um, for the propagation of correlations uh, if you have a look sort of here at the um, at the the blue shaded re region as being essentially the um, the sort of region over which sort of correlations have built up starting from an initial product state or uncorrelated state um, sort of as a function of distance uh, sort of in a time t and of course this grows sort of as this linear light cone as time goes forward um, so we can start to ask questions like what happens instead if we now have these systems that have natural long-range interactions that, for example, drop off as, as some sort of power law in the distance. So there's been um, sort of quite a bit of work on this um, from a variety of theory groups in various different places in the course of the last few years. And you can show that if you have, for example, these algebraically decaying interactions going as 1 over r to the alpha in some dimension d, that instead you get these kind of uh, algebraic uh, or polynomial light cones that indeed allow sort of faster spreading of correlations um, sort of up to the point where these things really become very long range where sort of this, um, this exponent sort of reaches the, um, the dimension of the, um, of, of the space. So why might these things be interesting? Well, obviously they're interesting um, because you can realize them in experiments and there have been experiments uh, in particular in trapped ion systems where you can in fact control the, um, uh, the exponent of the algebraic decay. Um, but they're also sort of broadly interesting in the sort of connections to information spreading and in particular information scrambling um, in systems where there are the connections to sort of questions like if we sort of start with maybe some quantum state and encoded sort of somewhere and then we try to take that and sort of spread it through the system or if we start with everything sort of uncorrelated and sort of see how correlations build up and how maybe entanglement develops between different parts of the systems and we can ask a number of sort of fundamental questions and connect it to a number of sort of things that are discussed in very broad communities in particular we can think about links to things like um, things like uh, quantum chaos or sort of signatures of chaotic behavior that come in a classical system sort of in the analogous quantum systems and especially by taking certain types of out of time order correlation functions turns out in these sorts of things that you can uh, link some of the uh, features of correlation spreading in the quantum systems back to um, chaotic effects in analogous classical systems it's also interesting because it sort of talks about indeed the growth of entanglement um, within the subsystems which relates uh, numerically to actually how difficult it is to to use things like tensor network methods to um, a sort of or time dependent density matrix renormalization group to, um, to simulate these types of dynamics. So it comes back to how difficult classical computation is and whether you can actually do things in a quantum system in a controllable way that you can't do 
um, on a classical computer. And in fact, um, the sort of standard examples for what we call fast scrambling, which is where you get um, essentially an exponentially fast buildup of these correlations and essentially a scrambling of this information um, on, a, on a, uh, an exponentially short time scale to, um, the, uh, to basically a sort of across the entire system, um, is the idea of having a spin chain that has random couplings or the applications in a digital quantum computer of random gates. And this is something that's been used in several papers by researchers at Google in particular to talk about how they might demonstrate quantum advantage in near-term digital quantum computers by applying random gates and showing that they are rapidly building entanglement and scrambling information in the system. So this idea of fast scrambling is important uh, also in the sense that it really goes beyond what you can calculate normally on a classical computer, so therefore it sort of speaks to, to quantum advantage in these systems. The other example where people have talked a lot about information scrambling is in the quantum mechanics, if you like, of um, black holes and ADS-CFT field theories. So there's a connection also across um, to dynamics in a very, very different community in theoretical physics. Okay, so we'd like to ask, could we find something like fast scrambling in these systems with long-range interactions? And uh, so what I want to do um, is briefly talk about two examples. The natural one that sort of comes up when you have these trapped ions, um, sort of where the interactions are mediated through the spin chain and you get sort of a one over R to the alpha um, sort of interaction. And then something that we've been talking with um, various colleagues about um, uh, what, what could be engineered essentially in systems with atoms and cavities, in particular uh, the group of Monica Schleyer-Smith at Stanford are building up very interesting experiments along these lines at the moment, and we want to sort of ask if this perhaps, um, where you can get a variety of rather more exotic spin models, this might be a route to deterministic fast scrambling in these systems. So if I start firstly with these systems that you get with trapped ions, where you have interactions that, that go as one over the distance to some power alpha, um, if alpha then is very large, you get short range interactions. As alpha goes to infinity, you get just nearest neighbor interactions. Um, if alpha becomes small, you get long range interactions. And we want to ask sort of how, um, how correlations propagate and how entanglement builds up in that type of system. And what we see is that we can sort of approach this in various different ways. In our group, actually, we've used a number of different techniques to, um, to approach this. We've taken a tensor network a numerical methods sort of generalizations of time-dependent DMRG for people who have used DMRG uh, also in chemistry. And what we've done is we've optimized this to look at dynamics for systems with long-range interactions. Um, and so we can actually, for short times at least, calculate exact dynamics of some of these spin models up to to relatively large system sizes. We can also get to longer times by looking at models that are either sort of exactly solvable, like long range tunneling models of, um, of fermions that are analog analogous to this, or indeed sort of mean field models or sort of various approximations to the, um, to the spin models that we have. And if we look at this in general, what we see for these types of systems with um, these algebraically decaying interactions is that when at short range we get the nice, clean, um, uh, sort of light cone-like behavior that we, um, that we sort of expect from the Lee-Robinson bounds. As we get to, sh to longer and longer range interactions, initially this sort of very clean light cone sort of disappears and is replaced by still light cone-like features, but where you have to set a particular threshold for the correlations to make it make sense. When you get to very long range interactions, eventually the sort of light cone sort of seems to disappear in the calculations. So could this be something like fast scrambling? The answer is, in fact, generally in this type of case, no, it's not. And the reason why is because the long range interactions sort of give you essentially far too much symmetry in the way in which you're rotating the system. And in fact, in many cases, if you look at how uh, entanglement builds up between two parts of the system, actually you can get into regimes where as the interactions become longer and longer ranged, in fact, you build up entanglement between different parts of the, um, the system more and more slowly. 
And the ultimate limit of that is when you have all-to-all -all interactions and you sort of just uh, start with a, with a quench with all the spins aligned and you have all-to-all -all interactions, you simply rotate the spins in a completely symmetric subspace, very strongly restricting the part of Hilbert space that you can get to in the dynamics. So in fact, in these sorts of long-range interactions, there tends to be sort of far too much symmetry to build up um, sort of very rapidly entanglement sort of amongst all of the different spins. You simply restrict the part of the Hilbert space that you get to on a particular time scale. So the question is, could we do something different? And what we've been investigating together with um, Greg Benson, Emily Davis, and Monica Schleyer-Smith at Stanford, with Steve Gupsa at Princeton, and with uh, Tomohiro Hashizumi and Anton Boyeski in our group, is what happens when you have spin models that you can engineer, but where you only couple spins if the separation along the chain is a power of two. That is, you couple nearest neighbor spins, you couple um, the second neighbor, the fourth neighbor, the eighth, the 16th, the 32nd, but nothing in between. It sounds very exotic, but in fact you could realize these types of models with atoms and cavities where you drive this sort of system at a whole different set of frequencies. If you put a magnetic field gradient along the cavity, you can shift actually the transition between the internal states for atoms as a function of where they are in the cavity, and then set up a series of drives that create these different couplings in the Hamiltonian in such such a way that they that spins are only coupled if, if they are at a distance where the frequency difference um, that you get in the magnetic field gradient between the transitions of those two spins corresponds to the frequency of one of the drive elements. This is a way in atomic physics that is relatively straightforward just by taking an acoustic optical modulator or an electro optical modulator and modulating um, the light that actually drives these transitions that you can actually go and uh, set up these types of spin models in a highly controllable way. So now what we're asking is what happens when you get these types of sparse coupling models. And it's, um, it's a very interesting sort of uh, system and one where we can actually look at what happens as we sort of, um, I should have said that on this slide actually, what happens is we change from a situation in fact where those interactions decrease as a function of distance and go also over to situations where the uh, interactions can increase as a function of distance. And we represent this by a power s, where if s is negative, the interactions decrease as a function of distance and where s is positive, they increase as a function of distance. So, um, of course, if we have them decrease as a function of distance, you get relatively local spreading of correlations. If they increase as a function of distance, then you get these sort of very strong couplings between, um, between spins that are very far away. Um, and in between times, you get these very interesting models where you get equal sort of couplings, um, again, between any sort of two spins that are separated by powers of two. And this is the S is equal to zero case. Naturally, what we find is that if we look at the entanglement, so here yellow is more entangled, this gives you the entanglement if I cut the system in two pieces at some point, which changes going from left to right, and this is time going up here. What we see, of course, in real space is if we cut the system in this way, if we increase S, we get more and more entanglement buildup. This is maybe not surprising because the long range interactions allow us to build up more entanglement between longer parts of the system. But of course, in a sense, by making the interactions increase, with distance, we're kind of cheating in creating these long-range correlations. So what we can do, of course, is we can remap the system so that uh, we have essentially an ordering of the spins where things that are more strongly coupled are closer to each other for this S-positive case. And if we do this, then of course we find sort of almost the opposite thing, that we get less buildup of entanglement for large positive S and much more buildup of entanglement in this particular way of writing the system for, um, for large negative S. But in each case, we get large buildup of entanglement for this S is equal to zero model. And if we take different ways of rewriting things, if we take a sparse coupling model that has equal couplings, we always seem to get this large buildup of entanglement in all the different ways, at least that we've found so far, to rewrite and reorder these, these spins.
Moreover, if you look at the dynamics of these, uh, of these systems and you ask how long it takes to reach particular thresholds in, um, in correlations, if you go away from S is equal to zero, we find again these algebraic light cones. But as we go towards S is equal to zero, this seems to break down and it seems to head towards the type of logarithmic light cone or exponential sp spreading of correlations that we might expect in a system that, fast, that, that is a fast scrambler. You also see chaotic spectral statistics if you look at the dynamics for small numbers of excitations where you can diagonalize the system. So um, it's very difficult to prove that something is a fast scrambler because you would need to show that you get essentially uh, for an exponentially large system that you get spreading of correlations um, in, a, um, in, uh, in polynomial time. But there's sort of very good circumstantial evidence, at least at this point, that this could be a very, very interesting system for rapidly building up entanglement and correlations in ways that could in, in principle be, um, be very useful. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, briefly thank the people uh, from my group who did the, um, the work on this. It's Tomohiro Hashizumi and um, Anton Boyeskish. Um, say again that uh, Francois Damine and, uh, and Elliot Mansfield, who's not in the photo, are here at the meeting presenting our quantum transport work. And, um, and also sort of thank Monica, Greg, Emily and Steve, our collaborators on these ideas. Um, and. Uh, just sort of summarized by saying that these AMO systems have a lot of elements that are different to things we've thought about in many body physics before. Long range interactions and controllable long range interactions in different exotic forms are one of those things that are quite interesting. And in, as an example of this, maybe it could be a way to access fast scrambling. If it is, it would be very interesting as a way perhaps to encode um, interesting quantum states in, um, in fast time, because sort of in contrast to previous um, sort of fast scrambling um, systems, you don't have random couplings, but rather actually deterministic couplings in these sparse models. In the sense, maybe even if it isn't a true fast scrambler, if that's the way that things work out, it could still be interesting uh, as a way to encode particular types of states. And one of the next things that we're doing is really looking at the sort of states that we might reach in terms of entangled states in the dynamics with these sorts of models. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew, uh, for that talk. Um, so I, um, I have to say, I'm, um, I'm a really good um, with a Rubik's cube, turning it from the solved state to the unsolved state. <laughs> I can do it really fast. I can scramble uh, Rubik's cube. I'm not so. I'm not as good as the reverse process, and but it seems to me that that sort of that reverse process is what would demonstrate you know real mastery over what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm wondering is, to what degree? Well, I, I'm assuming maybe theor you know theoretically or numerically you can always like reverse time and so forth. But how hard is it, or um, for an experimental system to be able to fast um, you know um, unscramble uh, one of these quantum systems? Mm -hmm. So I think I can give two answers to that very briefly. So there have been various ideas as to how to engineer spin models in a way that you can reverse the overall sign of them, especially in this context of trying to measure these out of time order correlation functions. Uh, there are also ways to do that in principle without reversing time evolution, but there are proposals for how to do that actually with atoms and cavities. Um, and so in principle, you could start to do this at least over short times. I would say the difficulty actually with this fast scrambling is that if it works in the way it it's supposed to, um, I would expect it also then to be very, very sensitive to any perturbations. And so actually one of the, the characteristics of this I would expect is that it would become very sensitive to perturbations as to whether you could actually undo the, the scrambling that you had done. Um, my own hope, but this is really the next sort of thing that we want to go and look at re research wise, is that this might make some types of entanglement actually robust or difficult to, to reverse in this. Um, um, but I'm not sure this is sort of something that we really have to go and sort of look at, you know, what we actually really do produce sort of in a, on a deterministic level by doing these types of dynamics. So um, 
you mentioned this is a computationally hard problem, at least for classical computers. Mm -hmm. So, but you do have uh, maybe quantum simulation or quantum computer. How do you tell if you did achieve a fast scrambler or not? That is, how do you actually measure some quality factor to decide if the information was properly scrambled? So I think that in the sense that the, that the, 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 the best thing sort of initially is to be able to measure these out of time order correlation functions, which gives you sort of certain amounts of, um, of information on that. There are also schemes that in principle would allow you to get a handle on entanglements that you'd built up between different subsystems. So there are proposals and in uh, Adam's not the collatus is demonstrations of measurement of, of entanglement. Um, the difficulty, as I said before, if you really want to prove in a rigorous mathematical sense fast scrambling, you want to show that correlations sort of build up with this logarithmic light cone, which means kind of if you really want to prove it rigorously, you need an exponentially large system. And that's a difficult thing to make clear measurements on. Um, but in terms of getting evidence for small scale systems, I would say the ability to try to measure out of time water correlation functions would be sort of a first step. And there are some really nice proposals that are out there, and I know that there are some others being, um, being published shortly that won't involve sort of um, a reversal of time in the experiments that could be directly used in these sorts of experiments that Monica is setting up. Well, let's thank Andrew again for a very logical talk and scramble. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, our next speaker uh, comes from uh, the mountains of New Mexico, uh, Rolando Summa, uh, who has appointments at UNM and Los Alamos and maybe a few other places. Uh, he's going to tell us about quantum algorithms for uh, solving linear systems. Well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I've been in Pittsburgh for the first time like five years ago, and I'm happy to see many of my colleagues like Andrew and Jeremy. And uh, today I will talk about um, quantum algorithms for solving systems of linear equations. I think the development of quantum algorithms is the main motivation behind building a quantum computer. And even though we have that big motivation, I would say that there aren't that many quantum algorithms out there that we know of, and there aren't that many techniques. So today I will introduce some of the techniques for this particular problem that I started to develop actually in a program that we had with folks here uh, that was funded back then by the Air Force. So this is joint work with Andrew Charles at Maryland, Robin Kotari, who's now at Microsoft, David Orsuch in Vienna, and Igit Subasi, who's now staff at Los Alamos as well. So the techniques I will discuss today are based on these two works um, with, uh, with my colleagues. And um, let me start by stating the problem. So, uh, you know, typically in quantum algorithms, uh, the techniques become highly technical because we have to assume the existence of a computer, a quantum computer that actually does not exist. And under some rules, we need to prove some sort of convergence guarantees that things are going to work. So in particular, for this case, uh, for, this, for a system of linear equations, we assume that we have a matrix A of n times n, this is dimension. Think of this big n as some number that is extremely large, exponentially large in some number of bits, if you want to. And there is an unknown vector, x, such that it satisfies this equation. Ax is equal to b, so b is given as well. So we have to solve for x. So certainly this is a very important problem in science, you know, engineering, and many other applications. And what we do know is that, in general, for classical algorithms that aim to solve for x, the complexity has to scale somehow polynomially, at least linearly, in the dimension of the, of the matrix. Okay? This is because we need to give it information Yes. Um, 
I got sorry, I couldn't hear. Correct. So I will make some assumptions later, but uh, typically we we may assume that A is sparse. Okay. That. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yes. So this is kind of like the best, you know, uh, general purpose algorithm basically. And you can avoid the complexity that scales with the dimension of the matrix. And there's some more conditions about the matrix. You may be able to do better, but this is like a good. Uh, estimate of the asymptotics of the complexity. Thanks for the question. All right, so we have to now uh, formulate like a quantum version of this problem, something that a quantum computer could do. And the quantum version is such that rather than giving us an output, the whole vector x okay, that solves the, the, the linear system, we want to output a quantum state that is a superposition on states on the computational basis, where each of the amplitudes has information about the solution of the linear system. Okay? So, in fact, because we cannot do ex things exactly on a quantum computer, we can uh, relax this, the exact state preparation, and say, well, given some error parameter, some epsilon, we want to prepare a quantum state, rows of x, that could be mixed or pure, such that is epsilon away from the actual state, uh, target state that we want to prepare. So this version of the problem is very restricted compared to the initial version that I said for linear systems. But it's useful if your problem concerns, for example, computing expectation values and quantities in the actual solution of the, of, of the linear system. If you want to compute each of the entries, then the complexity is going to be back to being exponential because we need to read at least each of the entries that has a dimension n. So there's more comments in this Scott Aronson article, read the fine print about the things. All right, so a few, a little bit about assumptions. So with no loss of generality, we may assume that A is a Hermitian matrix. We can say that A is sparse. If it is not, then the complexity of, you know, how far from sparse is, is going to enter in the final uh, complexity estimates. We have to assume that the matrix is invariable and it has a condition number kappa, that I call kappa. Kappa here it measures how far from being invariable it is. If that is infinity, it means that there is an eigenvalue of zero, it cannot be inverted. But if that's finite, I mean, the closer to one it is, the easier it will be to invert. And other you know, assumptions, for example, expect that the norm of A is bounded by one. It's larger than the eigenvalue can be bounded by one. So, a typical model that we consider for quantum algorithms is what we call the, uh, the query model. Um, here, what we basically say is that there is a unitary operation that allows us to compute the matrix elements. Okay, so if I input i and j, I can compute the matrix element a i j just in one shot. And that same oracle I can use, for example, to tell, okay, what is the first or second or third non-zero matrix element in a given row. And those things I can do typically efficiently. I will assume that they can be done with cost that is one. I will also assume that there is a procedure that allows us to prepare some initial state that encodes the amplitudes of the vector b. Okay? And um, whether this procedure exists or not for a particular application has to be investigated, if, whether it can be implemented efficiently or not. Okay, so note that if we can prepare this state, then preparing the solution state is basically applying the inverse of the matrix to that state, and then we would be done. But this is not easy to do because the dimension of the matrix is exponentially large in the number of bits, so we have to come up with an efficient procedure if we really want to speed up classical algorithms for this problem. All right. Okay, so what, what was known about this? I mean, I'm sure that many of you heard that there were quantum algorithms for solving linear systems of equations. So back in 2008, um, the, there was a paper by Harold Hasidim and Lloyd, the HHL algorithm. What they showed basically was that there was a quantum algorithm that if we now measure the complexity in terms of how many queries we have to do or how many state preparations we have to do, then that complexity went with something like the condition number square, now the logarithm of the dimension over the precision parameter. So we can claim an exponential speed up in this case because the dependence on the dimension is only logarithmic and not linear or polynomial. Okay. So the subroutines that they used for this type of algorithm were well established way before, and they were based on things like Hamiltonian simulation, like implementing evolutions with Hamiltonians. 
something that, I call phase, uh, that, that is called phase estimation and amplitude amplification. I'll talk a little bit about this um, uh, later in my talk. So the complexity here depends on quadratic in the condition number. There was later improvements by Ambinus in 2012. So rather than using amplitude amplification, he came up with a more um, complicated way of doing amplitude amplification that I, I took a little bit more later as well. And what he was able to do was to improve the complexity to something that was linear in the condition number. And this can be shown to be optimal in terms of the condition number. But in terms of the precision, then the complexity got worse. This epsilon is fairly small quantity in typical. And our improvements, OK, the first one was back in 2017. We came up with a quantum algorithm that still we did almost optimal in the condition number, logarithmic and dimension. But the next thing was that we had an exponential improvement in complexity cost in terms of the precision parameter. So this is a logarithmic function, or polynomial in logarithm, which is, you know, is a function that grows much slower than anything that goes with 1 over epsilon to some power. For this type, for this algorithm, we use Hamiltonian simulation. We have to avoid the phase estimation step. And we uh, introduce a new technique called linear combination of unitaries that now has been used in many, many quantum algorithms to improve their, uh, their complexities. And we use variable time ampli amplification that was introduced in binance, by Ambinance in previous work. And very recently, we came up with a quantum algorithm that was motivated by adiabatic evolutions in which the complexity is very nice. We don't achieve the logarithmic scaling 1 over epsilon, but it still is optimal in terms of the condition number. And rather than using all these complicated subroutines, we just can use Hamiltonian simulation. Okay? So it's very easy to implement, and the number of resources involved is very small in terms of ancillary qubits and so on. All right. So uh, why are these in, you may ask why these improvements are useful. Well, it turns out that if we use the complexity, uh, the former HHL algorithm for a variety of problems, we end up with pretty much no speed up, but with the ones that we were able to improve. And then we came up, for example, with new quantum algorithms to estimate properties of Markov chains that will show the quantum speed up. Um, they, um, also, having a small complexity uh, um, dependence, for example, on precision is useful if you want to achieve uh, uh, measure expectation values, for example, as the so-called quantum metrology limit, uh, which is uh, precision uh, measurements. And, and the next thing about the last quantum algorithm, as I said, because it was so simple, it turns out that people were interested right after we submitted the paper. They implemented quantum algorithm in NMR to solve the largest uh, linear system up to date, which was basically an 8 by 8 dimensional matrix. <laughs> All right. So, as I mentioned, I mean, the version of this version of the problem, the quantum version of the linear system problem, um, is gives you the solution that is encoded in a quantum state. It doesn't give you all the entries of the, of the final vector. Okay? So, so actually, well, you know, we can still claim that there is a quantum speed up for, because we, there seems to be some problems for which this could be useful. But for actual applications, I mean, we were not able so far to prove that that exponential quantum speed up actually is manifest for that for those problems. Um, so for example, I mean, there's a number of references here. But in all these cases, for, um, one work is about the resistance of computing the resistance of the network. The other one is, as I said, computing um, properties of Markov chains. Or even you know, if you want to use this algorithm for machine learning problems or differential equations, all the speed ups that can be shown here are actually polynomial. Okay? And the reason for that is because those problems do not fit exactly, you know, perfectly well in the definition, in our definition of the quantum linear system problem. So finding more applications could be actually great for this type of algorithm. Okay? And one that would be useful, practical, and where we could still claim a quantum uh, exponential speed up. That would be great. We don't have that yet. All right, so let me. I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. Maybe can you? OK, all right. So I'll explain, I explain roughly the former HHL algorithm back in 2008. So 
again, we're giving the matrix A, that matrix has eigenstates, eigenvectors, eigenvalues lambda j, because of the assumptions, those eigenvalues are bounded by one and one over the condition number. All right, so the way that it works, the integer algorithm works is the following. So suppose that we prepare the initial state, B, that with no loss of generality can be a combination of all the eigenstates of A. Then there is this so-called phase estimation algorithm that what it does is that whenever you input an eigenstate, it gives you an estimate of the eigenvalue of a matrix, okay? And that estimate is in the new ancil uh, register of additional qubits, ancillary qubits. So this register contains the eigenvalue estimates, and the way those estimates are, are such that if I were to make a measurement, I could obtain zeros and ones, which could be like a binary decomposition of the eigenvalue, or an estimate of. This is a well-known technique for, for quantum algorithms. Then after that, when we, once we have the, those estimates, we can add one ancilla qubit and perform a rotation with different amplitudes. One amplitude will have one over something that is proportional to the inverse of the estimate of the eigenvalue, and then the rest of it. At this point, I could have done pretty much any transformation that was dependent on the eigenvalue, but since we are trying to invert matrices, then I want something that goes with one over the inverse of the eigenvalue. I undo the second step because I have to, to implement the, the inverse of that operation. And if I look at the quantum state at this part, then there's going to be something that looks pretty much like this, okay? Plus something that goes, you know, with the ancilla has one, but something that I don't want, okay? So if you look at this state, it's like I apply something that was proportional to the inverse of the operator, almost to the state B, this encodes the solution to the problem, and then there is something that I don't want. So at this point, I could say, well, let's measure this guy, and if I got zero, for example, then I'm done. I solved the problem, right? Well, that's gonna happen with some probability, so I will have to do this many times until I succeed. There is actually a technique that we call amplitude amplification, that what it does is that whenever we have a quantum state like this, we apply like many times these operations here, and we can boost the amplitude of the desired state pretty much up to one, okay? And that is more efficient than just measuring many times on different copies of the quantum state. All right, so the, the important thing of this, uh, or all these techniques basically is like, okay, what is the complexity? So in this case, Basically, the complexity is pretty simple. It's just how many times, how many rounds of amplitude amplification I need to apply, and what was the, com the complexity of the phase estimation step that dominates the complexity of all the steps that I gave before. And because in this case, um, eigenvalues can be as large as one and as small as one over the condition number that can be very close to zero, one can show that the overall complexity at the end is pretty much uh, quadratic in the, in the condition number. All right. So, as I said, there, was, there were improvements about this algorithm. The first one was given by Ambanis on variable time amplitude amplification. And uh, the main improvement was that it's, uh, instead of having a complexity that was quadratic in the condition number, it was, the complexity could be made linear. So the basic idea of variable time amplitude amplification was that instead of applying this amplitude amplification step at the end, that amplitude amplification was um, basically implemented uh, by different steps, uh, whether the eigenvalues were large or, or were small. And this is a fairly complicated technique, and I certainly have no time to go into the details of those. But one important thing is that this technique makes ne it needs many, many extra qubits to work. The second improvement was given by us, by me, uh, uh, myself, and colleagues. And uh, in this case, we introduced a new technique called linear combination of unitaries. So it turns out that the complexity is almost still linear in the condition number, but we could improve exponentially in the complexity in terms of precision. All right. So I give you a you know, quick idea of how this works. So we want to implement the inverse of an operator. So if I take the inverse of x, well, I can use a fully transform approach and write down an integral form for this. 
If I approximate the integral by a Riemann sum, and now I replace my x by the operator, well, it turns out that I can approximate the inverse of a by some sort of linear combination of exponentials of this form, and this, you may think of those as being evolutions with the Hamiltonian a. So basically, when we do this approximation, what we are doing is the following. If we have the inverse function plotted here, okay, then we are approximating such a function by something like this, that is a very good approximation for the range of the eigenvalues that we care about. We don't care about the eigenvalues that are around zero, but only for those that are greater than some one over the inverse of the condition number. When you do this approximation, it turns out that maximum evolution time with A satisfies this condition. It depends logarithmically on the inverse of the precision parameter. And that's basically where the gain is coming from. I did not explain you how to implement linear combinations of unitary operators, but you have to believe me that this is a problem that's been investigated you know, for many years now, and it can be done efficiently. And when you put everything together, it turns out that the complexity for this problem looks pretty much like something like this. All right, so the last algorithm, the most recent one, I said was uh, inspired by adiabatic quantum computation. So how does this work? Well, let's take the initial system of linear equations, okay? And now let me define a, an operator I call PB perp, which is basically the projector that is orthogonal to the vector B. Okay, so the vector B is pointing along some direction and I make a projector in the in the orthogonal subspace of it. Alright, so this guy here is not a Hermitian operator. But then now I can define a Hamiltonian that looks pretty much like this. I put this operator B in one of the blocks of the matrices, B dagger on the other one. Um, this is Hermitian, and when you apply this Hamiltonian H to the vector x, which is the one that solves the problem in this case, it gives you zero. So now the problem reduces to basically finding the eigenstate of eigenvalue zero of this Hamiltonian here. In fact, this technique may be also used for classical algorithms for solving linear systems, but that's um, something that is currently being investigated. All right, so how do we prepare, uh, how do we design a quantum algorithm for preparing eigenstates of Hamiltonians? Well, one approach is the so-called adiabatic approach. I mean, in the previous talk, we, we saw uh, these ideas of using, for example, dissipation to prepare quantum states. Here, we want to do it in a coherent way. So let me make some assumption, like, for example, uh, you know, the matrix is now positive. It's bounded by, you know, one of our uh, the condition number from below. So the goal in adiabatic quantum computing is to prepare the eigenstate of a Hamiltonian starting from the eigenstate of something that is very simple. That is simple it's a simple Hamiltonian and a state that is easy to prepare. And then I want to turn the certain parameters, for example, in the Hamiltonian and make some sort of interpolation of going from the initial Hamiltonian to the final one. And if I satisfy the conditions of the adiabatic theorem, I go slowly enough then with high probability I would be able to prepare such a state. So by making this assumption that the matrix is positive, I can now define a family of interpolating matrices that start, for example, with identity matrix and converges to the operator A. And similarly, I can define the operators B of S and an interpolating family of Hamiltonians that looks that way. All right. So, there is this so-called randomization method, which is like a version of uh, adiabatic quantum computing, in which the idea is to prepare the final eigenstate of the Hamiltonian starting from the initial one by performing a sequence of projective measurements of eigenstates along the path. It turns out that those projective measurements can be very well simulated by evol evolving with the Hamiltonians for random time. The complexity of the randomization method depends on the length of the path, how far is the final state that I want to prepare from the initial one, and the inverse of the spectral gap of the Hamiltonians along the path. It turns out when we plug all the numbers here for this particular problem, the final complexity is what I stated at the beginning. It's almost linear in the condition number and goes with the inverse of the precision. So, 
So the quantum library is very simple. For this case, we need to choose the number of points in the path. We need to pick what are the going to be the parameters. And then at each of the points in the path, we need to sample some evolution time according to some uniform distribution. So at the end, it's basically applying Hamiltonian evolutions to the initial state. All right, so the next thing is that in contrast to the VTA um, variable time amplitude amplification and phase estimation um, approaches, in this case, I didn't need any control operation or ancillary qubits uh, for, for its implementation. So it's more attractive for near term applications, and in fact, this is what it was done recently in the paper by Wan and Law. All right, so I'm done. So a few conclusions is that. Yes, uh, quantum computing is promising, so we are starting to investigate uh, its applications for linear algebra problems. That's uh, still pre there's many open questions there. So I presented some quantum algorithms to solve the to solve linear systems, whatever solve means in this case. And it turns out that the techniques that we introduce can be used for other uh, quantum algorithms as well. And as I said before, there's been a lot of work along those lines as well. So. There's a few advantages. For example, the complexity of the first algorithm is only polyalgorithmic in the precision parameter, but still needs many ancillary qubits. And the second one is very simple because it just reduces to Hamiltonian simulation. So it would be interesting to understand what is the application range for this type of algorithms. And well, thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Sure. Uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, so I have a question about this, this is algorithm. So you're starting out in the, uh, basically a Hamiltonian, which is basically infinitely degenerate. And I'm wondering how uh, crucial that is uh, of an assumption, because it seems to be that's a very special type of Hamiltonian. And usually, like you go from like one spin Hamiltonian to another. and in terms of you know crossing you know breaking degeneracies Correct. and so forth that, that's that, an excellent question so the Hamiltonian is actually not uh, infinitely degenerate but there is a degeneracy so it turns out that um, the degeneracy is well can be well identified because there is some register you know that is kept in zero for example along all the path and whenever we implement and if we start itself for from the initial state and we follow this path, there's never going to be transitions to other states in that degenerate space. Right, but is that a consequence of the fact that you're starting out in uh, H0? Correct, zero? yes. OK, so if you, but if it, you that seems if, like it's hard to do experimentally. Correct, but if you are not, and you are epsilon away, then you can guarantee that this is going to work within an epsilon. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, my my question is basically: Does your work give us some insight into where quantum advantage comes from? Uh, you know, let's say in the early days, the talk was well, it's all entanglement, uh -huh. and then that was shown. You know, that yes. that's not it. So, so has something emerged can, which can be expressed in not too long a set of senses as to where the quantum quantumness comes in and, and provides an advantage. That's an excellent question. So, it, I mean, solving linear systems of equations, you may think this is not a natural problem for quantum computers to do. Um, however, the fact that we can reduce this problem to a Hamiltonian simulation problem that is more natural that's where the speed up is coming from. The fact that we can reduce this problem to that one. It's not particular for the linear system, for solving linear systems, but there's many problems in linear algebra that can be reduced Hamiltonian simulation once, and that's where you can see that the speed up is going to come from. In fact, it can be shown for this particular case that whatever I can do with the quantum computer, then if I had a machine that could solve this version of the problem, then I could do the same that the quantum computer does. So it's as powerful. Yeah, and under the assumptions, I mean, the models are basically equivalent to each other. So it's the quantum Hamiltonian. Yes. Correct. Thank you. Um, why don't we thank all of the speakers from the morning session? <laughs>
with their great insight, the PQI staff actually built in an extra 20 minutes of free time. So we still get a 20 minute co coffee. Okay. Okay, the first speaker of this uh, session here will be Professor Eric Bittner of the University of Houston. Like this one to uh, Eric's an expert in uh, dynamics of electronically excited states of molecules, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he'll be talking today on excitonic quantum logic states. Once we get all the technology working. Oh, the quantum photons working right. again. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the two. First of all, I want to thank the, the organizers in PQI for uh, 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 inviting me. I'm, I'm currently on sabbatical at uh, Durham University in the UK, so it's a good, good, it was a nice opportunity to come home uh, for the springtime. I, this is the first time I've been back in the States for a couple of months, so it was, it's nice to be back. Uh, I had a little bit of a interesting way or interesting sojourn getting here. Um, also, I want to thank the, and this isn't Newcastle, but this is, this, I realize. But anyway, uh, this is, um, a lot of my, my, my sabbatical is funded by the Lever uh, Trust, and I want to thank them for uh, lots of funding to spend time in, in Durham. And uh, the, what I want to talk about today is a little bit along the lines of our first few speakers, uh, looking at how um, quantum entanglement uh, comes into play in, 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 in dynamical systems, but, but as a molecular physicist, uh, my focus is always on what I can pull out of the molecular system and trying to think about how I can use quantum light, not so much as a computing uh, object in, in, in and of itself, but actually how, is, how to use it as a probe of the dynamics and correlations that are going on within a many-body system. So the, 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 the paradigm model that I'll look at is a photon going in, uh, interacting with a cavity filled with a bunch of spins, which could be two-level systems, could be molecules. Um, and then we look at, we probe this by looking at the outgoing photon, uh, or maybe even outgoing photons. Um, and in, in, in doing so, these out, outgoing photons uh, carry in, in information about the entanglement uh, going on within the system. And, and maybe as a, as a political statement, we could uh, think about a, another way to, to state this is make photons quantum again. Uh, and when we teach spectroscopy in our typical nonlinear, you know, even in, if you read through most of the work by Bukamela, et cetera, uh, we, we, we tend to throw away the quantum aspect of the photon and simply look at it as an oscillating electromagnetic field or an impulsive type prob, uh, uh, system. In making photons quantum again, we really want to treat the photon uh, in the cavity as an equal partner with the dynamics of the molecular system. And this is a very difficult problem, a very difficult many body problem, adding on top of a difficult many body problem. Uh, this is just part of an ongoing collaboration that I've had with Carlos Silva for years and years. Um, going back to even when I was a, uh, we did a Fulbright in Canada talking about some of the uh, ideas of how we can start using quantum condensates and et cetera. Uh, and also with Andre Piratinsky at Los Alamos, uh, we've, we've had lots of uh, work looking at um, quantum phase transitions in nanorods and uh, driven open quantum systems. And, and, and anyway, so these, these are sort of the, um, uh, the, the pieces of the pie, if you wish. Um, and, and, and I think the, the shot across the bow, at least in terms of the U.S. In, in interest in quantum light and quantum spectroscopy and sort of pre, um, precipitating in this National Quantum is Initiative has, was this really interesting paper that came out in Science uh, 2017 where, where the, the Chinese were able to bounce entangled photons or bounce a, a, a photon, part of a, an entangled pair of a photon from a satellite and uh, transmit information quantum mechanically from one city to another city. Um, you know, and this is a, you know, highly desired for secure communications and communication channels. And you know, I, I mentioned this at a meeting a couple years ago, and I think it was Laura Hertz at Oxford said, "Yeah, this is probably of mostly interest by drug lords, terrorists, El Chapo, and Donald Trump, so you can send secure tweets. But maybe Donald Trump really isn't so interested in secure tweets. But anyway, um, but our goal in a lot of this is is to think about, you know, if I have a molecular system in a cavity and I put in an input state." And I use, I think of this molecular system as simply a unitary transformation that does something to the quantum state of the photon. 
you know, that's, that's it, you can you can formulate all of this in the same language as you would in, in, as a quantum logic gate, where you would have a control bit in the upper block of this two by two matrix, and then a manipulated bit in the bottom. And you know, ultimately, you know, we'd like to be able to string string molecular systems together. Maybe this is like one of the things we could do. Maybe build it together as a uh, as as a way that one can take a quantum uh, entangled photon source, manipulate the quantum for photon source, and look at photons in coincidence as a means of doing quantum computation. And again, the scalability and everything else is, 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 is difficult to deal with this. And of course, one of the things that with molecular systems, uh, you want to do this at finite temperature, uh, which is a, an issue that we also have to deal with. So we, we have to deal with the fact that, that these are uh, systems that undergo decoherence, undergo dephasing, and under, undergo different kind of things like that. Um, and, and for our work, we were inspired by a paper that was in uh, uh, Scientific Reports uh, 2017. It's a paper by Kalashnikov and Karvitsky et al. Uh, and it's a really interesting um, paper. In, in, the, um, in, in, in the abstract, what caught, caught my eye in the abstract was it is probably difficult to read. It's even difficult to read here. It says that it, you, you, exploiting quantum interference of entangled photons is possible to measure the defasing time of a resonant media on the femtosecond time scale down to 100 femtoseconds using accessible continuous wave laser and single photon counting uh, with a technique that's called the Hongo Mandel interferometry. And, and as again, somebody who likes to talk to ultrafast spectroscopists and think about ultrafast processes in molecular systems, being able to measure a 100 femtosecond time scale process, even though it's a, basically the homogeneous line shape of a, system, of a quantum emitter. Uh, with CW ordinary off-the-shelf laser sources. Now, granted, a Hongo Mandel interferometry setup is about ninety thousand dollars or so. But you know, being able to achieve one hundred femtoseconds with a hundred thousand dollar apparatus is um, intriguing. And then and there's another paper that that we that, I, that I, I noticed in uh, Scientific Reports about a year earlier than this. And again, has this sort of beautiful statement in it that says that the entanglement spectrum. If I look at, if I can look at, you know, some spectrum that that, that like for example the entropy. Um, um, contains useful and non-trivial information concerning the many-body correlations in a condensed-based systems. And so this, this really sort of set the stage for us thinking about, well, how can we uh, use quantum entangled photons to really dig out and, and pull out these many-body correlations? So um, let's think about this in terms of a bipartite system. Maybe the photons are A and, and the system is B that I'm interested in. And if the system is separable, or maybe even if I have two subsystems within the same, same block, if the two subsystems are really separable, then uh, there is no entanglement between the two. And so we, we, we've heard about these, this idea of, of entanglement growth is due, due, due to uh, correlations uh, between the different subsystems. Uh, and if you have correlations between the subsystems, you, you, you start getting uh, entanglements, and it's sort of the, the, the measure, the, the entanglement is really a measurement of, of how interacting the two different subsystems are, how, how many correlations, how many co contacts but do I have between the subsystems. Um, you can quantify this in different sort of mathematical ways. You have the Rennie entropy, you can, you can quantify this as a purity. And, and the real, the, the significant, the sufficient condition for entanglement is that the entropy of of, of the subsystem is bigger than the, the entropy of the whole system, and likewise uh, with A and B. And you can also show that if A and B are, are members of the same pure state, that the entropy of A and, and the ent ent entropy of B are, are necessarily the same. And um, that's an interesting thing uh, to think about. Um, and uh, again, we've, 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 we've heard about entropy and in different contexts today. Um, you know, what we want to look at in terms of a spectroscopy uh, so that, you know, if, if, you, if, if, if you, you know, can I, can I look at changes in the entropy as a correlation or, or, or as, a, as a measure of many body interactions within the medium? So if I have an incoming Fox state of photons and I, and I look at the entropy of that state and I, and I look at the outgoing wave function of photons and I look at the entropy of that state, changes in that entropy should give me a, uh, a changes in that entanglement should give me a measure a uh, direct measure of the um, interactions going on within the system. If there's no interactions going on with the system, one photon sees the sees the system, another photon interacts with the system, and they never talk to each other uh, via the via the medium. But maybe it's possible for a photon to go in, another photon that's that's that, that's 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 a member of the same Fox state, and interacting with each other through the medium, which is which is what happens in a polariton system, uh, and they go out carrying that carrying forward that interaction. Um, 
and, and, and basically you can show, again, that if I, if I write out the, the scattering matrix or the, 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 um, the, the transformation between the input to the output state that I would have, for example, that maybe F is the input amplitude, if I, I can always write this, um, the, the amplitude, the, the, this, this transformation as, 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 as in the following way, it's probably a decomposable way, as a product of, of, of an amplitude for one, fo one particle scattering, uh, an amplitude for this, the other particle scattering, then an irreducible term that I'm going to write is some sort of uh, summation, like, like, like for example, like this. And you can perform Schmidt decomposition. You can show that the entropy must always change because of the interactions that would be carried through this non-reducible non form. Okay, so what I want to be able to do then is to come up with a physical theory for, for this irreducible form. Now, um, and, 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 and being in, in the UK uh, pre presently, uh, we, we, we deal with this issue of irreducibility and separability. Uh, very much up front uh, on a daily basis because as the EU is, you know, your, uh, England is trying to divorce itself from the EU, maybe forming a state like this, uh, we have to deal with the fact that maybe people want to cross the border and go back and forth between England and Ireland, or in my case, going back to the United Kingdom. But also in the United States, uh, we deal with this in the following way. Um, we have uh, one set of actors another set of actors and cross-correlators going on in between. Um, of course, according to the Mueller report, there is, well, no collusion, but that's not quite, quite true because uh, all of this is going on in the watch, under the watchful eye of uh, Robert Mueller. He just has the most beautiful eyes, I think. Um, and anyway, so yes. Okay, so um, in the Hunger-Mandel experiment, this Kalashnikov experiment, I, I love this, this analogy. So in the Hunger-Mandel experiment, what we want to be able to do is, 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 is imagine we put a system uh, here in one arm of the Hunger-Mandel interferometer. Now, the way the, the Hunger-Mandel experiment works is you create an entanglement. In this case, we'll have the, the Trump photon and the Putin photon. Uh, one goes one way, one goes the other way. And of course, you don't know which one, which one goes up and which one goes down because they're entangled. Um, and, and you allow uh, a movable mirror to adjust uh, really the, the, the path length of, of one of the, the upper arm photon uh, relative to that of the, of the lower photon. And if I take out the, 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 the sample uh, S, uh, you can bring these two photons back together in a beam splitter, recombine, and look at coincidence. And it's really easy to, to, to show a basic, um, again, a, you looking at the beam splitter as a unitary transformation, um, that, it, that, that, that if the two path lengths are the same, you get a zero uh, in between, and you get this, this what's called a Hongo Mandel dip. And what we wanted to do is to say, well, let's imagine that uh, one of the photons, maybe the Vladimir Putin photon, goes through the sample, picks up some sort of interaction with the sample, and then when it's recombined with the Trump photon, and I go back to, and Robert Mueller measures all of this, do I still see evidence of, of the uh, entanglement, what has changed, what is, what is different, and what can I then correlate what's going on within the system, or can I correlate dynamics in the system to the, uh, um, this entanglement spectrum? So the way that the Hunger Mandel interferometry works, um, it, this, is, this is a simple pictorial way to look at it. If you have two photons of the same color uh, going through the beam splitter, um, you, the, you, get a, you get a negative sign for the, for the case where one photon goes up and one photon goes down. And so that cancels exactly if the, if the, uh, the, the uh, the two photons coming into the, uh, the beam splitter are, 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 are identical. Uh, and then the, the, the non-coincident terms um, correspond to, you, you get an additive term. So but, you know, in, in, in doing an experiment, you can throw that away because the only thing that I want to look at is, is, is when I have two coincident counts within a given threshold. Uh, time uh, at, 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 the, at the coincidence counters. And this is, this is a really beautiful experiment uh, from, from uh, Hungo Mandel, uh, 2000, or not, not even 2000, 1989 um, experiment, uh, which really shows you know, this, this, this idea that you can look at photon coincidence uh, and that there is this, this quantum mechanical entanglement between photons. And, and, and this, this is, again, a picture from the Kalashnikov experiment. This is also a Kalashnikov car, by the way. Um, if you have no sample in, in, in the beam arm, uh, you, get, you do, in fact, get this, this, this Hunger Mandel dip, which is this zero at, at zero time delay. Uh, the wiggles are simply uh, uh, the aperture function. This is just the, the photon amplitude coming out of the SPDC. Uh, it's just a Fresnel uh, 
uh, aperture. And then if you put a sample in, in the pathway, you get a shift. Everything is, is, is shifted over to positive times. Uh, everything at negative time is there's a little bit of ringing from the uh, original aperture. But all of this change is exactly due to um, the, the interaction with the sample. And if you just simply take a Fourier transform of that signal, deconvolute uh, the, 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 the input line shape, uh, you, 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 you pull out the uh, homogeneous line shape of the quantum emitters that are in the sample. Okay? And, and so, um, you know, the, so how does this come out mathematically in terms of if I want to look at the actual wave function of the, uh, or the probability density or the counting rate of the, um, at the coincidence, uh, it, again, it's, it's, it's straightforward to, to, to put this together. Uh, you, you have an input amplitude, which is F. You have a scattering amplitude, which is S. So in other words, one photon goes through the sample. Uh, and I think I have an omega-1 that, that's, that's swapped on, on, on the upper term. The, the upper term is simply a background, which we, we, which we really don't need to look at. The lower term is where all the, the business occurs, uh, where, you, where you have uh, the, the Fs are simply a property of the KHP crystal. And there's probably a, a star that's, that's wrong. Um, and then a, a term with the material sample, and then the then, then delay stage. So what we want, again, as a molecular person, I want to be able to take, here's molecule A, tell me what S is going to be. Okay, or tell, here's a system A, uh, what is S? And so this is, is, is ultimately a scattering problem that I can write down just in terms of like I would in any sort of molecular scattering uh, process where I, I have an input uh, wave function that I'm going to bring in from minus infinity, propagate it in with a Muller operator, different Muller, um, and then output it back out to infinity, uh, uh, projecting it out in, in the following way. And, 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 and with this, if I, if I take the expectation values, I, I get the, the response function uh, is, is a function of frequency z, and this, this is the S, this is a scattering matrix. Now, how I, how this occurs with with photons, so you have to be a little bit careful with photons, because, at, you know, in, in the difference in um, molecular scattering or atomic scattering, I can always have clear asymptotic separability between the atom that says coming in in the molecule or whatever target is over here. This is really an asymptotic state. If you're dealing with photons, that separability is never really is difficult to maintain. You have to be very careful in doing this because of the fact that the atom or target here is always interacting with, with the photon field. It's never outside of, a, outside of interacting. Even in a vacuum, it's still interacting with, with the photon. So you have, to be, you have to address things properly to do this right. The, the, so, so it's easy, it's a little bit easier to, um, to, to separate the asymptotic photon and, and the material by, by placing everything into a cavity and then looking at the exchange of, of, of a non-cavity photon with a cavity photon and then everything inside the cavity can be dressed uh, properly. So we do this um, and, and, uh, and, and, I'll sh and I, 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 I don't think I have the, the slides for the uh, uh, we, we use a technique for what's called input-output theory. So we imagine that the um, photons are stochastically exchanged one for one for the cavity at a given rate, and then output uh, to the out uh, at a given rate. And the test case for all of this is is the Dickey model. And the Dickey model is 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 like one of these um, toy models that goes you know back it goes all the way back to the 50s. Um, uh, uh, and it, it's su it's such a subtly um, complex system. You know you you have a series of of, of, of spins. That you, you can you can collect together in a common uh, uh, spin quantum number uh, j, uh, and you have a, a photon field psi. Uh, in this case, a single mode cavity, and this looks like the simplest, quite it's quite simply the simplest problem you could imagine trying to solve. Um, it's amazingly complex. And first of all, I, I have it written in this this non-rotating wave approximation form, which is critical. Um, if, you, if we do this in the rotating wave approximation form, where we would only have uh, the coupling between uh, psi dagger and, and j minus and, and psi and, and j plus, where you would have a conserved number of, of particles in the system, the system really doesn't undergo anything interesting other than its Rabi oscillations. If you include these non-rotating wave terms, uh, you get um, a, a, a really a phase transition, a symmetry breaking phase transition that, that leads to the effect of, uh, of super radiance and, and non super radiance states in the system. And it's that sort of onset of super radiance that we wanted to look at uh, with 
uh, quantum light. So what is super radiance, like I just said? If you, if you, if you, if you break this down into the, uh, what's called the James Cummings model, I have a spin interacting with a, with a, with a boson um, in, the, in the following, couple, following way, uh, perform holstein primakov on this. You can write down uh, all of this in terms of, of interacting oscillators. And, and you get these counter-rotating terms. And it's interesting to note is that in this particular model, uh, that number, number of oscill the number of excitations in a system isn't conserved. It's, it's the, so the number of eigenstate, energy eigenstates are not number states. So, it's a, so n is conserved on average, but, and, and there's also a phase uncertainty in this system con con consequently. Um, and if you do that, uh, and you look at the Heisenberg dynamics of, of a system like this, on resonance, uh, you wind up getting an instability whenever the coupling is, is on the order of, 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 of the frequency. So you get this um, uh, super radiant phase that, that occurs. One mode grows exponentially, one, one mode dies exponentially. And this is the uh, onset of super radiance. Uh, and if you put a bunch of oscillators together in, in, a, in, in a cavity, uh, you, you start approaching the thermodynamic limit and you undergo a, a quantum phase transition. And, and, and this is a well-known uh, effect. There's just some issues with this. Um, you know, whether or not this is a, a, true phase, a true quantum phase transition, whether or not the system is gauge invariant, uh, and, and such has been debated in the literature. Uh, for an open quantum system, those, those issues are not uh, necessarily uh, uh, of concern because you're, you're always pushing photons in and out of the system. Um, and so anyway, so what we wanted to look at with this idea of quantum light is what is going on in a Dicky model system on, as I push it through this uh, instability region, as I push it through the phase transition. It's a very difficult, you know, monitoring onset of phase transitions in any kind of system is, is, a, um, is, is difficult and, 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 uh, and certainly spectroscopically difficult. Um, but we wanted to see what would what would be something that you could get out of this. So again, let's look at what's going on. If I have a if I have a Dicky model in a cavity that, that allows photons to leak out of the cavity um, around the onset of of the of, of the phase transitions, this is plotting the lower polariton branch uh, and, and and it's in its conjugate. Um, as a, function, as a function of the coupling strength, which is proportional, if you want, to the number of spins that are being represented in this lattice. And so as I push through the phase transition, which at this point occurs right at this, where this little bubble opens up, you wind up again with this, this growth of one mode and a decay of another mode. And, and, and this sort of width of this uh, phase, if I had zero cavity leakage, uh, that, this point that I'm showing with cavity leakage would be exactly zero. But if I have a little bit of cavity leakage, I, I, that, that expands out. And so you have one mode that grows, which is, which is these uh, blue lines, one mode that, that, that decays as I go through this. So what's going on in that case? If I go through the, um, uh, if I look at this, and um, there's, there's a, the normal regime, which is your normal radiant regime, which is, which is identical to what you would get with rotating wave approximation, and then a super radiant regime, which is something that you would not get with the, with the um, uh, rotating wave approximation. Uh, you, you can see that different modes of the system, um, different expectation values of the system grow and some, di some die off as I go through the, the super radiant transition. So you can see that the amplitude, for example, of the, uh, of the photon field grows, um, one mode of the amplitude grows. Uh, as I as I go through the system, as I go through the through the super radiant transition. So, what, what, what would I look at if I if I were to take a Dicky model and plug it through input output theory, calculate S matrices and all that kind of stuff, and and we can we can look through the sausage if you wish. It's it's, it's in it's in our paper uh, that I reference here, um, and you know you, you get we get signals. We we get what would be uh, experimental signals if you could actually do this experiment. And as you go through the phase transition, you get you get more wiggles. Great. Okay. So what is this telling us? So okay, great. You get more wiggles. They're all in the right place. What we think it should look like. It looks like they're stretching out to farther and farther time as I go through the phase transition. Okay. I said this is Carlos and I at Telluride, and, and we say, hey, great. What's going on? Um, so you look at the Fourier transform of the signal. It's really what what the, what the what, what's going on at this, if I if I take the Fourier transform of each one of these, I'm mapping out the poles of my scattering matrix, um, and, and and hence the eigen the eigen modes of the dynamics of this of this non-condensate to condensate system, uh, and I can do this, and um, 
And as, again, as a function of the number of emitters that we put into the system, you push yourself through this phase transition. Now, if you're, if you're, um, you know, if you, so you sort of blow this up, and if we can carefully uh, tune the number of emitters or the the, the, the the coupling strength or how hard I drive the system, um, I, I start expanding out this. Um, this super radiant transition a little bit, and you start seeing some really interesting and complex modal structure that's evolving as the system is undergoing a quantum phase transition from the non-radiant or the, non, the, the normal radiance to super radiant regime. And 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 this this really got us really got us interesting. You know what's going on? You have this sort of different kinds of modes that are growing at different kind of ways, and 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 there's some very complicated many-body dynamics that are going on in the system as the system becomes very collective uh, and, and undergoes this uh, quantum phase transition. So that, that gave us an indication that, yeah, there's some very non-trivial information that one can extract out of um, a system. This is simply looking at one quantum photon going through the sample and then partnering with its pair back to a beam splitter and looking at um, uh, the output signals. This is you know, what would be the, 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 the quantum spectroscopy of a single emitter um, undergoing a, or a, an ensemble of emitters rather, undergoing quantum phase transitions. So again, looking at this in, in a molecular viewpoint, you know, I want to be able to dig out, well, what's going on within the system. You know, de dealing with, with, with toy models and spin models is fun. I can do this on the computer, or, or we, can, we can play around with, with different kind of condensates. But again, uh, you know, the, the first you know, part of my appointments is Department of Chemistry. And so I need to think about um, how can, what about chemistry can we get out of quantum light? So let's again think about you know, what might be of interest in, 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 in a chemical sense. Well, in, in, in my own area, I'm interested in how excitons interact with each other. How do excited states, what, happen what happens to molecules in their excited states? And so let's imagine that I, that I have two chromophores, C1 and C2, and they're pegged together on maybe a biomolecule or a DNA like any Marcus likes to work on, or maybe on, on, a, on, a, on a stretchable chromophore. And, and I say, well, let's imagine that those are just two uncoupled qubits, and I have a red photon and a blue photon that's interacting with this whole system. Um, and, and they, they're, they, they're, they're coupled to each other both by, by hopping. There's a, there's a repulsion term that says if both, 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 terms are, if both sites are excited, that the excited states have an anharmonicity that increases the energy. And I allow uh, excitons to hop in between. And I also allow the whole system to be photo excited. And I get an energy level structure. This is simple. Uh, you can work through. If we're dealing with uh, molecular aggregates, we, we would call the lower state with negative J uh, the bright state. The, uh, our, a J aggregate state, we'd call the upper state by H aggregate state, which is dark. Uh, we'd have a ground state and, 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 a, and a double double excitation state. So, okay, right. What can we learn about doubly excited by, by exciton states with quantum light? So, um, let's just let's let's just let's, let's just look at it first of all as, as as a cascade. Can we get anything out if I put all my excitation in the, the, the upper state? I look at the two photon emission. This is just simply not even putting in an input state. Look at two photons coming out of a doubly excited system, and sure enough, yeah, it's, it's, this is again an analytical result that you can you can work through uh, with non perturbative Green's functions and um, calculate the the outgoing uh, photon. Uh, photon photon uh, amplitudes for a system like this. And sure enough, yes, you, you get this really interesting asymmetry. And in, in depending upon uh, uh, the, the kinds of interactions that you get in the system. Now, if you have an interesting case, the non the, of course, the non, -inter non interacting system is not very interesting. It's nice and symmetric. But there's also an interesting case where um, the, the intermediate level is exactly in between the upper. The, 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 the upper level because the the, uh, the anharmonic interaction is canceled out by the, the by the hopping term uh, fortuitously canceled out uh, then you again also wind up getting this uh, nice and um, separable photons going out by but, but again you can analyze the entropy of this sort of two photon state that comes out of the system and then say something about the nature of the interactions of the system and again this is a you know it would be a real, relatively straightforward frequency resolved coincidence measurement. Now, excitons interact in lots and lots of different kinds of ways. Inter in they interact with their environment. They interact with the fact that, that their coupling is being modulated by the fact that 
that their transition dipoles are doing this, they're doing this, and they're doing all sorts of kind of crazy dynamics going on. Can we pull out something about the dynamics by looking at, 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 these, at these interactions? So again, going back to this idea that I had, well, let's imagine that I can write out the scattering matrix, uh, which I'll write out as S, in terms of a series of interacting scattering events whereby um, one photon, let's say the, the, the K1 photon going out to K prime photon, interacts with one of, of my uh, two level systems. And the other guy interacts with the other one of the two level systems. Of course, you don't know, what, you know which one is which. But, and, but, but every once in a while, the two level systems in their excited state start talking to each other. Maybe they interact once, twice, and so on. Well, this is a problem we can solve analytically. This is just gives you a geometric series in terms of this interaction. And I can always, re, again, decon, uh, I can always rewrite that geometric series into something that looks like this lower equation. So if I do that, um, I get something that looks like the following. Let's just imagine that every time these excitons interact, there's, there's an interaction term. Let's, let's call it squigma, a little squiggle here, and there's a, there's a phase that goes along with that. And if I simply uh, allow that contact interaction to be a constant, just something I just, every time I interact, I get one of these, I pick up another a, a little psi interaction, and maybe a phase, I average over the phase, and, and, and you can get, um, you know, again, going from something that's nice and separable uh, with no interaction to something that would in, in, enjoy uh, and this anti-squeezing uh, with due to the interaction. So, this, so in other words, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the degree of squeezing that I get in the two-photon two output state and the Fox state that goes out and this interaction. Analytically, one can show this. Um, you can show this here. So this is, uh, you know, is it straightforward to work this through? You can show that the that if you do single value decomposition on these these functions, you can show that the single value decomposition are related to the the uh, this entanglement parameter that we 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 impose. You can calculate an entropy, and there's a one to one mapping between the entanglement parameter and the entropy that one would measure by, by simply doing single value decomposition of this uh, two photon uh, state. Uh, you can allow the interactions to be, um, maybe they're random, maybe there's some, some noise that, that, that's on it, that goes on in the system, uh, and, you, and you phase average over the whole thing. Um, interestingly enough, if you, um, if you have phase average scattering, again, you, you get this uh, analytical form for the, uh, for the entropy. It's a little bit messy, but it's easy to work out. But again, there's a separability that depends upon the magnitude of the interaction and also the magnitude of the noise that, that, that's modulating the interaction, okay? Um, if we allow that interaction to be Gaussian, or the noise that, 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 that's, that's, uh, that, that, that um, drives the, the interaction to be sampled from a normal distribution, you get something different. And it was, what was interesting in, in working through this, again, this, these are all just analytical results for the most part. Um, you get different kind of, of biphoton squeezing. You get different kinds of photon states Depend, in the output, depending upon the kind of noise that's driving the, the two excitons. So again, you're, you're, you're getting dynamical information by looking at you know, a, a, a measure of, of, of the, the, the cross correlations between this exciton to this exciton by looking at the output photon state of this, of, of, of this kind of a system. Now, this is probably a hard experiment to do, but nonetheless, it, it, it tells me that and it maybe it's a little hard. It's easier if you look at the entropy itself. You know that you know, there's this, 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 there's a there's a squeezing that's going on, and it's entirely due to this this very weak interaction between excitons. Um, so we, we we put this a little bit further. And again, being somebody who likes to think about spectroscopy, whenever you you you're, you you think about uh, random processes driving uh, spectroscopic dynamics, you immediately fall back to the, the you know the the, the venerable. Uh, Kubo model, uh, which you know is, is this uh, uh, beautiful paper by Kubo back in, in the 50s or 60s, um, reviews of uh, advances in chemical physics, um, and basically in, in the Kubo model, which is what we teach in our spectroscopy class, if you have a single oscillator uh, that has a, a, a modulated energy gap uh, that that is Gaussian on average, that, that gap uh, it averages about its, its, its bare transition frequency, but you have um, a Markov uh, decay in, 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 in the following form, that the, that the, the correlations in the, um, 
and, and the noise drop off uh, exponentially in time. There's a, there's a correlation time for that and a magnitude for that. Okay, this is the, 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 the heart and soul of the Kubo model, which gives us the dephasing time, homogeneous line shapes, non, uh, and, and et cetera. Um, if we assume that this cross correlation also has this Kubo form, we can write out any cross correlations uh, between the uh, one photon transition frequency and the other photon transition frequency at a different time, again, in this exponential form. We we'll just postulate that that's possible to do and, and, and that this would be the, the form that we would get. Uh, and, and, and you can then calculate, again, following through a Kubo type analysis, a cross correlator between uh, one, fo one exciton and the other exciton. Now, the, dif the difference at this point is, is that you have to be very careful about when. Uh, you have to be very careful time ordering because you don't know when, t uh, when, which which photon arrives first, when and which photon departs first. And you can you can sketch that out in the following way: that you have th th uh, six possible different processes that go on three, and or pairs of three processes that go on. And there's different ways you can time order this particular integral again, depending upon which photon arrives first and which 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 photon doesn't. And 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 what we find you get you get some expressions that are nice and complicated looking correlation times uh, expressions. And of course, these are all up, up, up at an exponent. But um, rather than dealing with this, you know, looking at these as um, you know, complicated expressions, what you want to do is, is to look at this in the limits of, of, of you know, when. Uh, so there's a, the common parameter in all of this is this, the magnitude of the fluctuation sigma and the time scale for, for that fluctuation to decay tau. If we look at this in the two different limits, as you would in the Kubo model, there's an inhomogeneous broadening limit where there would be no entanglement. And in the inhomogeneous broadening limit, that term is very small. Everything becomes separable. Okay, everything is separable, and, and the magnitude of this depends upon the timing between uh, uh, of the incident and outgoing photons. So when did one photon leave and when, when does the other one go? There's also an, a homogeneous broadening limit, in which case, you, you, you know, it's sort of like the, the system is being slowly modulated by the environment, and uh, you, you, you get, you're, you're sampling all possible uh, environments, at the, the uh, uh, co-environments of the system, and you wind up getting entropy generation for the system. Um, let me just go forward. Uh, you, you can also do this with resonance scattering uh, from J aggregates. It's a little bit more of a uh, complicated expression. Uh, and, and, and in doing so, you, we, 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 we show that you can distinguish between J aggregates versus H aggregates uh, simply by um, the outgoing photon am amplitude of the, of the system. And so again, why quantum light? Um, I think uh, we're, we're, I've managed to convince at least myself and maybe Carlos Silva, who's my collaborator, that yes, that, that, that this is very sensitive to many body correlations. There's a lot of um, non-trivial correlations that one can extract from a system like this. Um, ultimately, one should be able to do this with CW sources rather than pulse sources. And I think this is relatively unexplored for uh, spectroscopic probes on, on uh, real molecular systems. So I, uh, Carlos is starting to do this, Andy Marcus is doing this, and a few other people in chemical physics are exploring this, but it's a relatively untapped area. It's difficult, but it's untapped area. So uh, I want to thank everybody uh, and, and thank uh, uh, my collaborators and you all for uh, inviting me, and let's make photons quantum again. Thank you. Okay. Time for questions? Yeah. Uh, can you say something about uh, the relative magnitudes of uh, in that cavity superradiant limit? Uh, the relative magnitudes of say G, the coupling, the decay from the cavity kappa, say and gamma, the decay of the excitons. Like, are you in like a strong coupling regime? This is a strong coupling regime. Yeah, it's, it's in the strong it's, it's coupling. Superradiant regime is clearly strong coupling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you can. You, yeah, is just, that reasonable for the experiments? Are you they? You certainly uh, see. Surely, absolutely, yes. You, you, you certainly see. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Dickey model is used as a, a, a model for Bose-Einstein condensation and 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 the in, in, in systems. Yes, it's certainly reasonable. I mean, you, the thing is, it's macroscopic, right? So as you build up more and more spins in the in the system. You, you, you push yourself into this uh, uh, super radiant regime. And, and but, but you also have more decay. 
Oh sure, yeah, but you know. You, so you, are you still in the strong coupling regime when you? Oh sure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, similarly, can you say like for the? Um, you were mentioning that uh, the nonlinearities are, are sorry, the in in that regime of like beyond the rotating wave approximation. You presumably yeah. again you have to have g comparable to right. the optical frequency yeah, or something that's, that's, like that. That's the, that's the criteria in the in the James Cummings model without RWA right. for the onset of super radiance. Yes, and again that g has a square root of n. Okay. Number so of that's where you're getting the. That's where you get pushed into. That's the where you're getting the enhancement yeah, from the square exactly. root of n. Yeah, exactly. Not necessarily from the cavity itself. No, 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 no. I mean, okay. The cavity sort of enhances the number of times that the, that the photon interacts with the system. Right. It certainly pushes you further and further into this uh, uh, strong coupling regime, but. Uh, but but uh, the, and and yeah. sorry, sorry. Finish here. Yeah, but but you know, still when you when you when you when you transform to the. Uh, uh, you know, from individual spins to this collective J, you pull out a square right. root of N. Right, you pull out the square root yeah. of N. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. does that still maintain with inhomogeneous broadening with polymers or, or the kinds of molecules that you're studying, does that still work out? Is, are all the N atoms identical in well, your... Well, certainly not. And, and, and that this is something that, again, um, uh, yeah, there, there is a limit uh, at, at which um, if you certainly, if you, if you have this, Absolutely crazy degrees of energy and homogeneity in the system. You, 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 your, your system just you never build up to that that large macroscopic number. However, um, you know if you think about it in, in in the sense that you know the the wavelength of light that you're you're dealing with in the size the molecular size of the system is very small. You're really sampling over lots and lots and lots of environments. So you could almost imagine that. Um, if you have a cavity mode, you're you're always sampling a very narrow region of this, inhomogene of this inhomogeneously uh, I see. sampled systems. So you're always build up. You can always build up a, a large network of, of polarity. This is what, again why in the organic systems you can get ring, room temperature condensation, uh, even though you would think this is a much more messy system than a uh, semiconductor system, and is you know because you can you're you're, you're stronger jet, a dipole coupling between the the, the chromophores, and plus you also can sample with a, you know, a single cavity mode, very large uh, wavelength. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Eric again. Okay, uh, next uh, we'll have Martin Head Gordon. Uh, Martin got his PhD here in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon working with uh, John Popel, and he's gonna talk to us about work he's been doing on developments of quantum chemical methods for treating uh, electron correlation. All right. Oh, smart. All right. Um, well, enough said about the penguins. Um, okay. So, um, so um, I want to tell you today about uh, conventional quantum chemistry, and um, and maybe this is a, an appropriate topic in light of the interest in quantum information, um, because um, because. 
quantum chemistry is viewed as one of the maybe promising sort of forefront areas for application of quantum information. And to kind of think about those issues, it's appropriate to put in context what, you know, what are the frontiers and what can be done and what can't be done today on classical computers. So, um, so let's see if I can get this thing to cooperate. Ah, all right. Um, okay, so the electronic structure problem is easy to state and hard to solve. Um, we firmly clamp our nuclei into position. We, um, we then simply seek the uh, lowest eigenvalue and eigenvector of, uh, of that electronic many electron Hamiltonian that describes the quantum chemistry problem, the electronic structure problem. And, um, and of course, it's the uh, inter-electron Coulomb potential that gives me a job, I mean, makes this problem difficult. Um, and, um, and the wave function, the exact wave function, is therefore um, an entangled superposition of determinants. And, um, and that is uh, impossible to solve exactly, but, um, but if you could, you would then have, in principle, chemically accurate potential energy surfaces on which interesting, complex, applied chemical reactions would take place, catalysis, for example. And, um, and so in the catalysis context, um, you could then discover mechanism. And, um, and my research, and in fact it's really in some sense been my research interest ever since I was a graduate student with John Popel, is um, trying to develop um, approximate models that are accurate enough to be useful and efficient enough to be feasible um, and, uh, and, and explore their implementation. So that's quantum chemistry in a nutshell and my talk today will then um, involve two different aspects of this. One is about the design of density functionals um, and then the second is about a simple wave function based method that um, can overcome some of the difficulties that density functional theory still faces. So de why density functional theory? Well, it is, um, it is used by on the order of 100,000 chemists, material scientists, condensed matter physicists. There's um, easy, easily 10 to 20 large software packages, one of which um, I have wasted much too much of my career on. Um, these software packages typically involve on the order of millions of lines of code. Ours is on the order of 10 million. It takes many people to put these together. They're on the order of 300 contributors to the latest version of our code. And, um, and in some sense, you have to work in teams uh, to get this kind of stuff done. And then you can do quite interesting, quite intricate chemistry. So this is some um, catalysis um, associated with a deals all the type reaction involved in, green, in the processing of green chemicals. Um, this is a path to, um, to the chemical that's the precursor to plastic bottles. And this was work that I did in collaboration with Alex Bell and a shared student of ours, Ipe Lee, kind of showing you the way in which you can walk through a very complex, intricate reaction mechanism. And, um, and today, roughly 95% of quantum chemistry calculations are done with DFT. That's not because it's a perfect theory, it's because it's a pragmatic theory. So it has failure modes and it's good to understand them, and, there are, and yet there are good reasons why it's so widely used, and it's important to understand those as well. And really, um, the bottom line is 95% of chemistry is easy. Um, the difficult problems, the ones where there are genuinely strong entanglements, it's not that they're non-existent in chemistry, but they're rare, relatively rare. Um, okay, so what then is density functional theory, if you're not familiar with it? Um, well, we seek to replace the entangled many electron wave function by simply use of the electron density as the basic observer, as the basic um, uh, function that controls the theory. And beautiful theorems, the honberg cohn theorems, guarantee that the ground state energy can be, in principle at least, exactly expressed as a functional of the density thereby creating um, a nice challenge. Um, the uh, first challenge is that, is that even today, there is no satisfactory density functional for the kinetic energy. So in fact, we use a single determinant of molecular orbitals, in other words, a wave function associated with non-interacting electrons to represent the 
the non-interacting kinetic energy exactly. The electron nuclear attraction and the classical Coulomb repulsion are likewise exactly represented in terms of the density, and this just leaves behind exchange and correlation as the truly quantum effects that are non-trivial to model as functionals of the density. And in my opinion, the true exchange correlation functional is essentially unknowable. In other words, we will never know it. The right, if one is after exactness, one should go via wave functions. However, one can model it and get acceptably close. And so this part of the talk is really about what is the state of the art, in my group at least, about trying to model the functional. And um, obviously, we're balancing accuracy against feasibility on, a class on classical computers here. OK, so, um, so in terms of trying to put this in some context, um, a very famous density functional developer, John Perdue, has introduced a useful categorization of density functionals as rungs on a metaphorical Jacob's ladder that ascends from some primordial ooze called the Hartree world, in which electrons don't even have the correct spin symmetry, and gradually ascends um, towards the heaven of chemical accuracy that would correspond to solving the electronic structure problem. So rung one is already somewhat useful, and that's the local spin density approximation, which solves the uniform electron gas problem exactly and leaves us with an exchange correlation energy density uh, that depends only on the density in a pointwise fashion. If you're thinking about electron correlations, this is sort of a staggering thing to look at because it involves the integral over only one electron coordinate, yet it is describing exchange and correlation that are two and higher electron processes. Then um, one can advance to the generalized gradient approximation where um, local density gradient information is introduced. That's rung two. And this is really the workhorse rung of condensed matter physics. And it competes these days for viability with rung three, which is introducing essentially second derivative information as well, the so-called kinetic energy density. And at rung four, one is then trying to introduce information that is um, wave function in character beyond the kinetic energy. And this is then exact exchange or a dependence explicitly on the occupied orbitals of uh, the cone sham determinant describing non-interacting electrons. And of course, at rung five, uh, approaching the heaven of chemical accuracy, one is then introducing a further dependence on the virtual orbitals. And at that level, almost anything is possible. And, um, and of course, the expense then begins to rise rather rapidly. So in some sense, this is the broad landscape of density functionals today. Um, and, um, and it does leave out one important advance that must be mentioned, which is that much of chemistry, especially in complex systems, critically depends on dispersion. Things like colloidal behavior, self-assembly, um, adsorption of reactants on active sites depends on dispersion, which cannot be described as a function of the position of just one electron at all. And so it's now common to dispersion correct standard density functionals. And, um, and this is done either with a, an interatomic potential, a la Stefan Grimmer, or alternatively as a genuinely non-local van der Waal density functional, such as VV10 or VDW DF2. These will be joint functions of two electron positions. And these corrections make a very dramatic difference in the accuracy of non-covalent interactions. So I'm showing you on the left a standard functional without dispersion correction and on the right with, and you can see the dramatic reduction in RMS error. Um, OK, so, um, so that's um, uh, setting the stage for the development of new functionals. And to further set the, set the stage, um, a challenge which was issued um, in this science paper from 2017, where the author stated that um, as, a, as a function of time, the accuracy of atomic densities became closer to exact ones, reflecting theoretical advances until the early 2000s, when this trend was reversed by unconstrained functionals, sacrificing physical rigor for the flexibility of empirical fitting. This, this statement's worth taking note of, which is that density functional theory is typically not a fully first principles approach to electronic structure. It's a somewhat empirical method, and then depending on how empirical you want to make it, it may simply become an exercise in 
in data fitting. The data that they were concerned about was the electron density of a dozen spherical atoms. And um, on the y-axis is the RMS error in the density of the spherical atom. On the x-axis, a little strange, it's the year in which the functional was introduced. And the point was this line, which is some sort of guide to the eye, showed improvements up to the millennium and then perhaps a degradation um, uh, reflecting the danger that uh, the authors spoke about. I would just note that all 14 of the worst post-2000 density functionals tested in that paper were actually developed by only one single research group. And so in principle, um, you know, this kind of analysis is tricky. If you remove those data points, the overall trend looks actually less unpromising. Um, so um, this is just a reminder that um, anyone who gets up to speak about density functionals should be a little humble about the possibilities. But the conclusion of the article was that overall DFT is in need of new strategies for functional development. And what I'm telling you about in this part of my talk is the new strategy that our group has been following for roughly the past six or seven years now. And this is what we call survival of the most transferable. And this is, um, in a sense, a form of supervised learning in which, um, in which instead of using a limited amount of data to train the best possible functional, we use most of that limited data to test functionals, um, and, and only a small fraction, about one-fifth of it, to train functionals. By doing this, we should be able to find something that has predictive accuracy rather than simply accuracy in its domain of fitting. I'm, Ideally, we would use a nearly infinite amount of data. In practice, we are limited to about 5,000 pieces of data. And as I say, we use about one-fifth of it for training, the remaining to, tr to then take a very large number, on the order of billions typically, of candidate functionals and try and look for which ones test best on the data that we have reserved for testing. Um, that testing process itself introduces some selection bias, so then we have to keep some secondary test data to make sure that after we select the best one, that it actually transfers to you know, data that's reserved for secondary testing. OK, and, um, and a lot of data, don't stare at it. It's, the main point to say is that this covers chemical energy differences that include non-covalent interactions. Um, so these are, that's the NC, um, broken up into easy and difficult. Difficult being the systems where DFT will have a failure mode. Likewise, isomerization energies I, thermochemistry TC, and barrier heights BH. Um, just a quick look under the hood. What is going on here? Um, the um, unknown bit, so remember everything else but EXC is exact. So here is the inexact model for EXC. And it's got, well, an unpleasant number of terms, five of them here. Um, three of them are um, the one-point correlate of the one-point functions, which look like, um, for instance, integrals over the coordinate of one electron, and then an inhomogeneity correction factor written as a power series in the density gradient if we were doing things at the GGA level, or a double Taylor expansion, 2D Taylor expansion, if we're including the kinetic energy as well. And these polynomial expansions make no sense to carry to very high order, so we typically truncate them at about fourth order. And then every parameter that's contained in these linear expansions, CJK here or CJ here, can either be included or excluded from a functional. And that's, that gives rise to a space of density functionals that we can train in and search over. And um, the dimension of the space is the most interesting thing then. So if we're doing the GGA type expansions here, we have five parameters for one expansion. We have three such, such expansions. So we have two to the 15th possible functionals on the order of 100,000. We can enumerate them by brute force. So this is not fashionable in machine learning where, where you try to avoid it. But this is the best answer you can get with a given amount of data. 
In the meta GGA, it's very interesting because we have then have 25 terms in a single expansion on the order of 2 to the 75th for the three expansions we require, or on the order of Avogadro's number of possible functionals. Of course, I cooked the numbers to give you Avogadro's number, but you get the idea, right? Um, this is a functional genome, in my opinion. You cannot search it explicitly. And it's an open question whether or not you can machine learn in that space or not. OK, and so that takes care of the first three terms. And then the last two are non-local corrections for exchange, so a two-point integral. And then the two-point integral I already mentioned for uh, van der Waals. So the result of this, to kind of try and summarize roughly um, six or seven years of work in one slide, is a bunch of functionals. We have trained on the order of a trillion functionals. We have only published four of them. And, um, and basically, we are stopping here um, because it's a little difficult to know what to do next. So um, each of these four functionals, well, the left one inhabits rung three, the middle two inhabit rung four, and the top one and the right one inhabits rung five of that Jacob's ladder. And they've got various characteristics. So the semi-local bit um, and non-local exchange, non-local correlation, um, we have either meta GGA or GGA. We have these no, sep no correction for non-local exchange. We always use a van der Waal density functional. And in the case of a rung five functional, we even have wave function type correlation in the PT2 form um, built in as well. The dimension of the search space and the number of parameters are interesting. So we have these giant search spaces. But in fact, we retain, in the end, relatively few of the parameters we could have retained. These are typically between 10 and 14 parameter functionals. And we allow, in the search process, the possibility of up to nearly 150 parameters to be retained. Why are so few retained? Well, in part, it's good. It means that we're building a smooth functional. And in part, it's bad, which is that our form is not flexible enough to use all of, uh, um, all of the capability that we allowed it. All right, so now let's try and summarize um, how these things do for chemistry. Looking across um, our database of about 5,000 data points, we test our own four functionals and, um, and roughly 200 existing ones and pull out from each rung of Jacob's Ladder the best performing functional. There is only one functional at rung one. So, um, so these are the one sigma errors for each of those data types I showed you before, non-covalent interactions, um, that are easy or difficult, isomerization energies, easy and difficult, thermochemistry, easy and difficult. To pick just one, the one sigma error here is 10 kilocalories per mole. Um, if you are tough in terms of your statistics, you'd like two sigma or three sigma. This is then becoming something like one, th one quarter, one third of the chemical bond energy. It's not useful. But at rung two, our combinatorial design could not meaningfully beat the best existing rung two density functional, which is in our hands for this data, the B97-D3 functional. And you can see how useful it is. It's a threefold reduction in RMS error for easy thermochemistry and, um, and similar or better for non-covalent interactions. So um, everything gets better, nothing gets worse you begin to see a significant difference opening up between the easy problems and the difficult ones. Again, we curated what's easy and what's difficult. We have reasons for it, but that's, it's important to see a failure mode of DFT growing in. At rung three, the best functional is our own combinatorially designed one, and it improves on, well, everything. No measure of statistical error gets worse. Everything gets better. At rung four, it's our range-separated hybrid meta GGA. Again, everything improves, nothing gets worse. At rung five, it's the same again. Everything improves, nothing gets worse. Let's take a pause and then say, and then ask ourselves, where does this stand relative to the best quantum chemistry um, that is done with wave functions? The answer is still significantly less accurate, maybe on the order of five to 10 times less accurate, at least, than the best couple cluster type methods. So this is very good, useful for a lot of chemistry, but, um, but not perfect. And I think the most 
the nicest thing about it is that the RMS error in each category decreases with each step up Jacob's ladder as represented by the best function at each level. And in that sense, DFT is statistically improvable. If you pick just one problem and you ask what are the errors as a function of functional, it doesn't necessarily go down as you go up Jacob's ladder. But in a statistical sense, it does. Well, you may say, this looks interesting and almost impressive, but it is his data, right? So. Um, so what about someone else's data? So this is um, independent assessment of density functionals from Lars Gorick and Stefan Grimmer's groups. This is the so-called GMTKN55 data. And um, at rung two over here, the best fun well, it's hard for you to read, actually hard for me to read even, um, B97-D3 is the second best functional they test, so that's roughly comparable to our conclusion. At rung three, the best functional is exactly the same as we conclude. At rung four, the best functional is exactly the same as we conclude. And at rung five, the best functional is the same as we conclude. So of course, the results depend on the data. This, by the way, is main group chemistry. So it's excluding transition metals, for which it's hard to get first principles data. Um, but nonetheless, um, this largely echoes the conclusions I showed you before. All right, so this looks quite successful. Caveats are you need large basis sets to um, actually get the accuracy that I showed this is capable of. And secondly, it doesn't actually solve the great problems of DFT. They still exist. This will f these methods fail for the difficult problems, which are associated with self-interaction error and strong correlation. There are interesting questions about can we go further, do better in the future with broader data? I don't know the answer to this, but we're trying. Other independent descriptors to make a better functional is the critical question. And that's the end of that part. And I will now switch gears to um, a wave function method that we've been working on for the last couple of years called Kappa OOMP2. And this is a regularized MP2 method. And I will try to explain both of these concepts to you. And this work was done by Junho Lee, a very, very wonderful student in my group who's graduating this summer. Um, if you don't know what MP2 theory is, let's just take a moment to refresh. So we're now leaving density functional theory behind and thinking about wave function based quantum chemistry. And the starting point is then mean field theory, Hartree-Fock theory, which is self-interaction free. That is, we do the exchange exactly. But it has no description of correlation beyond the statistics of fermionic exchange. So if we do perturbation theory, textbook basic non-degenerate quantum mechanical perturbation theory, starting from mean field, we have a zero order problem with a zero order eigenfunction, which is the Hartree-Fock wave function. This is the mean field Hamiltonian. This is not the Hartree-Fock energy E0, but if you take the expectation of the Hamiltonian, well, that would be the mean field Hamiltonian plus the fluctuation potential, which is the perturbation. So Hartree-Fock theory is correct to first order in this kind of perturbation analysis, this muller plesset series, which is where the name MP2 comes from. And MP2 is then the second order correction, almost right out of a textbook. The first order wave function, which turns out to be a sum over all pair correlations, over all promotions of two electrons at once out of the Fermi vacuum. And, uh, and, um, and you get an expression that involves then double excitations, pair excitations of, well, a matrix element squared divided by a denominator, just like you expect from second order perturbation theory. And that denominator is differences of empty orbital eigenvalues versus occupied ones. And it should worry you a little bit that it appears as the inverse here. So in other words, in interesting problems where the LUMO and the HOMO come close to each other, this denominator is going to blow up. And this theory, this MP2 theory, uh, will not be very good. A way to say that is that this is a good theory for the atomic-like correlations that would occur between two electrons in helium, but a bad theory for pulling apart the, the H2 molecule to break the chemical bond, unless you break orbital symmetries. So this part of the talk is really about 
the role of symmetry breaking in um, Hartree-Fock and MP2 theory. And I want to first assert to you, and it's really true, that Hartree-Fock orbitals can exhibit large artificial symmetry breakings, and that's a result of the orbitals distorting in some way because we've neglected electron correlations. So here is the spin squared value for the phenylalanine radical, which should be 0.75. It's a doublet after all. But when you do unrestricted Hartree-Fock, you get 2.1, which says that there is substantial quartet and maybe some hextet contamination in that radical. If I take a polyene chain, like this C30 chain, I, it should also, actually it's a polyenal radical, I should get 0.75 for the S squared value, it should be a doublet, I get 5.3. There's a whole raft of higher spin states that have mixed in to try and lower the energy associated with this limited variational trial function. So what's a cure? Well, a possible cure is to take what I showed you on the previous slide, the Hartree-Fock energy plus this correlation energy, and use that energy function to vary the orbitals. And perhaps because that includes electron correlation, the orbital should then recover. And this has been explored for roughly a dozen years or so. Um, and the punchline is that if you just do it, you get almost exactly what I claimed. You get very nicely cleaned up spin squared values, indicating that with the presence of correlation, the orbitals no longer have to break symmetry to minimize their energy. So that sounds good. Let, uh, now let's turn from artificial symmetry breaking to another extreme, which is essential symmetry breaking. This is a theory that does not describe strong correlations, so therefore it either Hartree-Fock or MP2 or OOMP2, the orbital optimized cousin, must break symmetry. So here is the H2 molecule, and you can follow the green curve, which is the energy, and, um, and you can see that restricted Hartree-Fock, um, which is the red branch, goes off to a crazy asymptote because it can't describe the correlations. On the other hand, the green curve, unrestricted Hartree-Fock, goes the, to the correct asymptote by breaking symmetry. So it's an essential symmetry breaking in my language. And, um, and then this right scale over here is the orbital Hessian, the second derivative of the energy with respect to orbitals, the lowest eigenvalue. And what you see is it goes through zero at a special point, the Coulson-Fisher point. And, um, and beyond that, the restricted or spin-paired solution becomes unstable, and the stable solution, which has the um, purple eigenvalue, um, is unrestricted. And so there's a Coulson-Fisher point at 1.2 angstroms, and that signals the onset of the strong correlation regime to the right of this, the relatively weakly correlated regime to the left, and eventually you get independent hydrogen atoms, well, uh, where the entanglement can be lost with an infinitesimal perturbation. So that's Hartree-Fock theory, and that's actually good. That's symmetry breaking that we want. Um, here's OOMP2, and of course, you only get a second to stare at this slide, but this slide should be shocking. It was shocking to me, anyways, um, originally. Now I've got used to it. Um, so, um, so OOMP2 does not have Coulson-Fisher points. So here is the uh, the green curve again for um, for spin paired, then br breaking away to become unrestricted, and in red is the restricted one. But actually, if you look at the eigenvalue the purple curve, it never goes below zero. So in other words, this restricted solution is always a local minimum in the orbital Hilbert space. And, um, and there is no Coulson-Fisher point. There is simply a second solution, a second independent solution that has spin polarized orbitals, but they don't, they don't um, have this sort of phase transition that a Coulson-Fisher point should have. Instead, there is simply a second solution that appears for bond distances greater than 1.6 angstroms. So this is actually very bad. They're disconnected solutions. And why is this happening? Well, it's, it's because the orbital gap is closing down and uh, the PT2 correction is beginning to exaggerate the effects of electron correlation. How could we try and fix that? Well, we need to regularize or modify the theory in some way. And the simplest regularization is a level shift. 
And, um, and unfortunately, when you look into that, and we have spent quite a while looking into it, it turns out very large values are needed. So instead, a better idea, it took us a while to come up with something really satisfactory, but a better idea is to actually have an energy-dependent regularizer that switches off the MP2 correlation when the gaps get small and leaves it unmodified when the gaps are big. And there's a parameter kappa here that controls that. And so as when kappa equals zero, we actually recover Hartree-Fock theory. When kappa goes to infinity, we recover OOMP2. This will interpolate between the two existing models. And while it's not easy to do it, we have got both orbital and nuclear gradients for both the common SCF methods and some slightly exotic ones that we'll talk about soon. And you can show analytically that this switches off to identically zero the correlation contributions in the zero gap limit. So instead of diverging like they would in conventional MP2 for small gaps, these rigorously go to zero. So uh, we can now interpolate between OOMP2, ill-behaved because it actually favors symmetry restoration unphysically, and Hartree-Fock, which may artificially break symmetry, and exploring in between should be very, very interesting indeed. The question is, is there a finite kappa value that defines a useful method? That's the first question. And I wanted to show you the answer is yes and give you some idea about it. So here is breaking the single CC bond in ethane. And, um, and again, this is the Hessian eigenvalue. We'd like it to go through zero to exhibit an essential symmetry breaking. Regular OOMP2 does not but different finite kappa values do. If we do it again for ethene and ethine, you see the same sort of behavior. And, um, and so we can recover Coulson-Fisher points with a variety of finite kappas. But which finite one should we pick, if any? Well, the first thing to say is probably between one and two is reasonable. But when you stare at it more closely, you actually want a regularization parameter of 1.5 or less in order to make the Coulson-Fisher point shorter for ethene than for ethane, and shorter for ethine than for, eth than for ethene. So we pick, we look now for something smaller than 1.5, and then we do a bit of you know, looking at data, thermochemical data. So this is RMS error in thermochemical data as a function of regularization parameter. It has a minimum, a nice deep minimum at about 1.45 that restores the Coulson-Fisher point, that's good physically, and minimizes the uh, thermochemical error. And in fact, it is better than both MP2 and um, OOMP2, not surprisingly. Well, it's a one parameter empirical theory. Transferability tests, we go look at um, hydrogen abstraction reactions, and one can see that the regularized kappa OOMP2 is almost as good as OOMP2, much better than MP2. And um, other tests, where well, we've got a whole bunch of them, I don't have time to go through them, basically show this is a pretty reasonable theory. So MP2 is the simplest post hartree fock correlation model, but it suffers from hartree fock's artificial symmetry breaking. We would try to cure that by OOMP2, but that must be regularized. Um, and, uh, um, and so the regularization, we suggest that this is the right way to think about a replacement for hartree fock theory. You can optimize the orbitals with this, do everything you can do with hartree fock theory, with all of the good things, the essential symmetry breakings, the simple single particle picture, and none of the bad things, no artificial symmetry breaking. It's not a quantitative method, in other words, this won't put people looking to solve the Schrodinger equation exactly out of business, but it's very interesting that we recover Coulson-Fisher points and essential symmetry breaking. And I have just a couple of minutes, I'm gonna try and tell you my last story, or at least a bit of it, um, which is how does this play out in molecules where we're not sure whether the symmetry breaking is essential, indicating radical characters in strong entanglement or artificial. And we're going to look at two fullerenes, C60 and C36, and we're going to consider not just restricted orbitals, but also complex restricted that break complex conjugation symmetry, well, unrestricted you know, and general that breaks SZ spin symmetry.
So um, C60, in principle, is a stable singlet species with a large singlet triplet gap. It has all the characteristics of a closed shell singlet when you look at experimental observables. Yet, it turns out to exhibit dramatic Hartree-Fock symmetries, um, orbital symmetry breaking. It's RHF unstable, and we found uh, a UHF solution much lower, and Gustavo Scazzeria's group, he'll talk later today, found an, another large energy lowering to obtain a complex general Hartree-Fock solution. And, um, and Gus and his group concluded the nature of the GHF solutions is consistent with the pi electron space becoming polyradical in nature. Each p orbital is effectively singly occupied. But we must ask the question, in light of what I showed you before, is that Hartree-Fock symmetry breaking essential, associated with the neglect of static or strong correlations, or is it artificial, associated with the neglect of many, many small dynamical correlations? These are qualitative concepts, but they have important consequences. So, Kappa OOMP2 is in principle a nice tool to investigate this, so let's try and do it. And, um, and what we'll do is consider a symmetry-breaking landscape where we go all the way from Hartree-Fock theory, kappa equals zero, to OOMP2, kappa goes to infinity. And we want, want to look for the critical value, kappa critical, that will restore broken Hartree-Fock symmetries. And so we've got these extremes, Hartree-Fock on one side, OOMP2 on the other, and in between we have a landscape where we go from artificial and essential symmetry breaking to artificial symmetry restoration, and we believe that in the middle we should see only essential symmetry breaking. And so this kappa symmetry breaking landscape can then be applied to C60. And um, this is a look at the measures of uh, spin symmetry breaking, and you see that all of these measures of spin symmetry breaking we recover symmetry around kappa is equal to 1, which is very strong regularization, arguing that, um, in fact, this was artificial symmetry breaking, not essential symmetry breaking. This is much less than our optimized value. So kappa OOMP2 suggests that C60 is not polyradicaloid at all. You can recover symmetry, you can restore orbital symmetries with, um, with essentially a uh, um, a st very strong regularization that admits only a bit of correlation. Okay, and then you can look at single triplet gaps. They're consistent. You find good agreement between restricted MP2 and kappa OOMP2. You can look at natural orbital occupation numbers. You find nothing that is significantly deviating from zero or two. And you find very good agreement with higher level theories. I don't have time to tell you about those, but we have methods for strong correlations that also show no strong correlation in C60. You might then cross-check against a reactive fullerene, C36. Um, and let's do the same exercise again. And what you see is something qualitatively different, which is the complex, the general um, orbital symmetry breaking vanishes early, but the unrestricted, it takes incredibly weak regularization to, uh, to actually restore that. So in other words, you're almost all the way out to the OOMP2 extreme when orbital symmetries are restored in C36. So this suggests that the general orbital symmetry breaking is artificial. That can be restored even with very strong regularization, but that the unrestricted symmetry breaking is essential in this molecule. In other words, C36 has strong correlation, as would have been implied by the Hartree-Fock results, and by contrast with C60, where Hartree-Fock, we think, is exhibiting um, artificial symmetry breaking. I'm going to skip this and stop. Um, so. I hope to have shown you that um, while we can't solve strong correlation problems in general, this method that I've described, kappa OMP2, is a very nice way to separate um, weak, uh, a theory of dynamic correlation from, um, from, from essential correlations, and we can then get um, symmetry breaking um, in a way that is physically meaningful, and um, it appears to resolve the origin of the, of the mysterious complex GHF solutions reported previously for C60, and in C36, um, those symmetry breakings are not removed. 
Okay, well, um, I need to thank Nabe Mardarossian, the student who did the wonderful work on functional development with me over seven years, Junho Lee, who's been with me for the past four years for the work on Kappa OOMP2 and the fullerenes, and I had to skip the bit about complex restricted orbitals. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, okay. You referred to machine learning uh, approaches essentially looking in the space of functionals. There was an effort I recall hearing about a few years ago to use machine learning methods essentially to directly construct functionals by getting various densities and then... Uh, um, what is the status of that? I mean, I know this is not directly your work, but I'm just... Uh, so my sense is that the biggest successes with machine learning um, have been to um, avoid use of the density altogether and go directly from nuclear positions to um, ground state electronic energy. Um, the efforts to do machine learning of density functionals using densities um, have been for incredibly um, restricted domains of applicability. So in other words, um, in other words, literally for say different geometries of a given molecule rather than a diversity of molecules such as we do. Martin. Yeah, nice talk. Uh, of course, I disagree that C60 uh, is not strongly correlated. I think it is strongly correlated. We, um, I'll have a couple of slides this afternoon to prove you, um, to prove my uh, disagreement having a, an important support from uh, calculations. Um, I guess what, if I understand your regularized KOOMP2, I'm a little bit surprised because not having symmetry breaking is kind of a good thing. So, no. so you regular. I mean, you, I mean, this OOMP2 thing is actually quite interesting. And when you put a kappa to make it break symmetry again, I don't like that. I think it's much better without that. You know, the exact wave function doesn't break symmetry, right? That's correct, but um, but this is a very um, poor scientist's theory of electronic structure, and um, it contains a description of just the atomic-like correlations. There is no good description of the um, bond-breaking left-right strong correlations, as as you know very well. And so um, and so, I would argue that NP2's um, false restoration of symmetry um, is a result of um, an incipient divergence. In other words, you cannot expect to get good numbers out of that symmetry restored OOMP2 method. The numbers are in fact terrible. They diverge. Um, so, um, so we must in fact reject the, the false symmetry restoration of a theory that doesn't have the physical ingredients necessary to properly restore symmetry. We're not spin projecting or anything like that. So this is just an MP2 energy functional. And the argument is that uh, we want to um, allow this to you know, have its own orbital phase transition to symmetry breaking when the electron correlations are strong enough that we can't adequately describe them with a single determinant reference, which this theory is 100% built upon. So anyway, I look forward to hearing about your C60 results, and I wanted to put this up uh, in order to set an appropriate stage. Yeah, so I wanted to make uh, two comments or observations. Uh, you may not know, and many people in the room may not know, that Plessit received his bachelor's degree in physics from Pitt. So uh, the, the second is you, you started off saying that about 95% of quantum chemistry calculations are DFT, and about 95% of chemistry is therefore easy. I would say that one, there's a selection of easy problems when you do DFT, and one cannot conclude that 95% of chemistry is easy. Uh, well, um, Ken, I, 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 I I think I must uh, I must potentially agree with that. There may be some selection bias involved uh, by experienced quantum chemists, and I guess I should have uh, recognized that. Okay. Well, let's thank Mark again. Okay. <laughs>
what you're trying to tell me is we go upstairs for lunch. That's what that signaling meant. Okay. 